call to order the October 17th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Certainly, Chair. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Cummings. Here. Hernandez. Here. McPherson. And Friend. Here. We'll begin with a moment of silence before the Pledge of Allegiance. Would any board member like to dedicate the moment of silence? Supervisor McPherson. You know, I'd just like to say generally, uh, let's have a prayer for peace on earth here and everywhere in this globe of all our So we need it now more than ever. Just hope people can communicate and really, well, just peace on earth. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Cummings. I also wanted to dedicate this moment of silence to uh, Laura Nadell. She was um, sadly um, passed away in her sleep on Saturday. Um, she was a community member who was loved by many in this community, did a lot of volunteer work, many nonprofits in our community. Um, she was a social worker. And she was also a small business owner, and she's going to be deeply missed. Thank you. All right, we'll begin with a moment of silence before the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, God, it is liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Flaska. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Yes, Chair Friend, members of the board, we have one correction. This is on the consent agenda, item number 21. There are additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 219 is replaced. Rec recommended action number two should read, accept and appropriate $81,811 from the county fire to transfer administrative support to the general services budget and approve addition of one full-time equivalent position to support county fire administration. That concludes the corrections. Thank you. Would any board member like to pull an item from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, I was going to pull item number 63. 63. Okay, item 63 will become, is it something that you just wanted to add additional direction to we could address on consent or is it something you need a more in-depth presentation on? I think we might be able to address it on consent, but I was... Not sure the best way to approach this. I could, I'm happy to make my comments and see if they can be. No, let's, let's try it on consent. If that's acceptable, I was going to make additional direction on it as well. We could just try it on consent. So we won't pull 63 at this moment. Any other supervisor on an item to pull to the regular agenda? Okay, we're going to open it up for public comment. It's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors as well. Uh, the comments need to be made about items that are within our purview or we may need to move on to an additional speaker, uh, also for items on consent agenda or on the regular agenda or closed session agenda if you're unable to stay for those items. Good morning and welcome back. Well, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. What is it? October 17th, 2023, 1989, 504. Pretty special example of uh, plate tectonics. Today would be my grandmother's 111th birthday if she were alive. I don't know if she would smile at this or you guys will either, but at Bilbo Baggins' 111th birthday, he started the speech, I don't know half of you as well as I should like, and I like half of you half as much as you deserve. Yeah, she probably wouldn't be initially smiling either. So I'm holding up this thing, your city government. You know, I uh, was able to pull four items off the consent agenda in the city council. My public comments were at 1313, which is just a really funny random number. Could make reference to a place in Chicago on 60th Avenue. Um, my first item on the consent agenda, number eight and 10, kind of had to do with the role of city and county managers that control all of you, all five of you like slaves. Since before 19, uh, yeah, Justin, don't pay attention. That's business as usual for you. Um, they started at 35 minutes. You know, I was able to talk on number eight and number 10 was kind of similar because it had to do with uh, how an unelected official is control of our emergency preparedness, including FEMA. So I was able to talk to th for three minutes back to back 
on uh, consent item, agenda item number 12, which had to do with the frequency weapons, and consent agenda item number 16, which had to do with the poisoning of the water, pumping sewage by standards that any intelligent person would, would question of the EPA into our system. So wouldn't it be interesting if this circle was one millionth of a uh, constitutional republic as the city of Santa Cruz? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mr. Uh, Benjamin Hart, and I've uh, prepared a, 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 a asking for consideration to incorporate uh, conservation courses into the Roundtree facility. I have a doctor's recommendation uh, in Santa Clara uh, that I uh, was going to work at Elmwood facility, but I have a property in Aptos, which I'm doing with uh, my dad. And I prepared a uh, schedule of, uh, it's an introduction to Cal Fire. Uh, I haven't got my doctor's recommendation yet, but I was wondering if it's something you guys could review and maybe consider um, to teach classes at Roundtree. Um, and to unite fathers and sons and uh, trail maintenance and stuff, exercise. Yeah. yeah, if you have something you'd want to leave for us, you can definitely leave it right here. Okay. I appreciate you coming forward on this. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can make my uh, come back on the next uh, date with my recommendation and stuff. And if you guys have any uh, any uh, any wisdom to incorporate or, or any considerations, it would be uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, supervisors, administrators, and staff. I want to thank you for the work you're doing to improve our behavioral health services. Um, seven years ago, yesterday, uh, October 16th, my son, Sean Smith Art, was wrongfully shot and killed by the Santa Cruz City Police, in part due to the fact there was no non-law enforcement mobile crisis response services in our county. So I wanted to talk about consent agenda item 41, the DHSS Crisis Act three-year plan uh, pilot program grant for non-law uh, non enforcement mobile crisis response teams. Uh, it's another essential step to ensure that families, members of our community, and our law enforcement offices will have services they deserve wherever they are and whenever they need them to appropriately respond to behavioral health crisis calls. And as the secretary of the Mental Health Advisory Board, we support your moving forward with accepting this multi-year award of $2.4 million and to direct the Health Services Agency Behavioral Health Division to negotiate a multi-year agreement with the Family Services Agency of Central Coast to provide mobile crisis response services to describe um, as described in the crisis pilot program grant application. The Mental Health Advisory Board thanks our, our county behavioral health team and the Family Services Agency for their dedication and work in successfully applying for and being awarded this grant to enhance 988 services by, by creating 24 7 non law enforcement mobile crisis response teams, and thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> morning, welcome. Good morning, Juan Magaña. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair, friend, and members of the board. My name is Juan Magaña, Program Manager with Human Services Department. I'm here this morning to, um, on behalf of the Human Services Department, to thank the board for proclaiming November 2023 as In-Home Supportive Services Caregiver Month in Santa Cruz County. <laughs> I would like to take the rest of my time allotted to read some of the experts from uh, the board's proclamation. Uh, whereas over 2,800 in-home supportive services caregivers provide home care services and support in Santa Cruz County, making it possible for over 3,100 low-income, disabled, and elderly Santa Cruz County residents to remain independently in their homes. And whereas providing services and support for the disabled and elderly to remain Living in their home is a humane, dignified, and compassionate alternative to hospitalization or other potential institutional placements that disabled and elderly adults become susceptible to without viable IHSS care. And whereas the County of Santa Cruz IHSS professionals pr who provide these physically demanding and emotionally challenging home care services to low income, disabled, and elderly Santa Cruz County residents do so with great sensitivity honesty, 
patience, trust, commitment, dedication, and compassion. Um, once again, um, I want to thank you for recognizing the work that I, just as caregivers, do to help some of the most vulnerable members of our community remain safely in their homes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning. Welcome back. Yeah. Good morning, all, all of you. So, mostly, when I'm, um, my name is Antonio Rivas from the City of Watsonville. I just wanted to re reiterate that uh, as part of the Mental Health Board uh, Advisory Board, I just wanted to support uh, moving forward and accepting the the minor money that you're going to apply for 2.4 million dollars and to the director of the health service agency behavioral division and to negotiate the multi-year plan is an agreement is important that we have that to apply because it will help our community it help the city of watsonville our residents as well as santa cruz county so it's important that you apply for that and it's important that to go forward for that application and i thank you thank you thanks for coming for that is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, Chair, we have a speaker online. Matt, your microphone is now available. Good morning. My name is Matt Farrell, and I'm here today speaking on behalf of Friends of the Rail and Trail. And we want to speak in support of items 51, which has to do with uh, the non infrastructure grant for um, the North Coast Rail Trail 52, which is continuing legal support from Remy Moss and Manley. And finally, item 53, the uh, cooperative agreement between the RTC and the County of Santa Cruz for maintenance of the North Coast Rail. We're very glad to see the progress that's being made on the trail and we look forward to additional work um, being brought forward to council. I mean, to the, to the board of supervisors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, I'd like to open with a quote from Rachel Carson. The road, the author of Silent Spring, the road we have long been traveling is deceptively easy. A smooth superhighway on which we progress with great speed, but at its end lies disaster. As county policies proceed with more and more wireless microwave technology touted as being fantastic, at the end lies disaster. And again, this quote from the film 5G Apocalypse, the extinction event. It's important to understand what the 5G is doing and what they say it's doing. We're told on the IEEE beam forming document that this technology cooks your eyes like eggs in World War II. We all need to understand these are military weapons. These are assault frequencies. If you garner nothing more than that, that's what you need to know. It's microwave radiation warfare. That's what it is. End of quote. LED street lights are also emitting 5G. So the county in voting for changes to the wireless ordinance and allowing radiation emitting assault weapons everywhere is doing harm to the public, not providing for the general welfare as you are supposed to. Justin Cummings, you sit on the Coastal Commission and voted for launching Thank a you, more of the- Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Chair, we have no further speakers online. 
Okay, seeing no more individuals and chambers, I'd like to address this in public comment. We'll close public comment and bring it to the board for comments and consideration of consent. Supervisor Hernandez, do you have any comments on consent? Uh, yeah, just a few comments on 251 and 64. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, just your microphone, please. Thank you. So 42, I'm always happy to see any uh, funding for any health programs in South County. And so I guess this is approval of some rollover funds for the dentist program in South County. So kudos to making that happen. And on item 51, of course, you know, I'm always excited about any of the additional uh, trail segments that we're getting on the rail trail corridor. So that's always exciting news. And on 64, I'm always glad that we're getting advancing on Westridge uh, to bring more uh, county services to South County as well. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, I just uh, have a few comments. Um, item number 29, I just want to thank the mayor of um, Imperial Beach for taking the time. Uh, our last Coastal Commission meeting, we were actually able to go to Imperial Beach and get a tour of this area where Many of the wastewater treatment facilities um, that are along the Tijuana River have not been functioning. And as a result, they've had um, a lot of the effluent being dumped directly into the ocean, which has now rendered many of the beach access closed. Um, I think um, well, when we were down there, the beaches were closed and it's been about it's been over 650 days that these beaches have been closed. And this is the extent of uh, natural bridges to about seascape in terms of distance of closed beaches and just as a coastal community wanted to lend some support to their efforts to try to help get more funding um, to repair those wastewater treatment plants so that they can have access to their beaches. Um, item number 41, um, I just want to thank staff for all their hard work on continuing to support the uh, mobile crisis response programs. This has been something that the community has really been asking us to try to push forward. And so it's just great to see that there's continued progress on this item. Um, item number 53, I uh, just want to thank staff for their work on this as well, but I also hope that um, staff can consider alternative funding opportunities that are included but not limited to the solid waste funds to support bike trail maintenance moving forward in the future. Um, so just really trying to think about how we can continue to fund um, trail maintenance moving forward, uh, it's, it, I think, is really important. And then um, on item number 63, um, I intended to pull this item, but hopefully we can get through this. I guess the one concern that I have is that the board would not be having any role in approving special events uh, moving forward with this action. Um, I think it's important when new events are coming forward that the board is able to have some kind of input and review. Maybe if they're repeat events and it's just kind of ministerial, that can be something that staff can just approve. But I know that, you know, for example, we had the Iron Man go through my district this year and a number of folks were really complaining about the roads being closed and the impacts on businesses. And so there are times when when events can have impacts on people within our districts. And so I just think that it um, is important that the board maintain some kind of role in approval. Um, so hopefully we can maybe talk about that a little bit more, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I guess the only recommendations I would have for that is that new events should be approved by the board and also that there may be an appeal process if staff reject an application that they can appeal it to the board in case there might be some difference in opinion on, an, on a specific event. Thank you. I think that we can add that additional direction uh, when it comes time for a motion. I had a similar, I'll speak to that item when it comes, but I my concern was similar that new items should come items like the wharf to wharf that have been coming for years there's no need um and but that also provides public works with the ability for us to review so that they don't also have all the responsibility in the same way for new events so i agree with you and i think we can make that amendment when it comes supervisor Koenig. thank you chair friend on item 26 additional outreach to disaster victims to understand obstacles in rebuilding and determine their interest in a transfer of development rights program i want to thank supervisor mcpherson for his uh, partnership on this item and uh, this this item really seeks to address the issue uh, or in question of when natural disasters destroy people's homes how do we re rebuild in places that are safer that's sort of a question that it's pretty obvious when you look at places like New Orleans or Florida, uh, that we're, we're separate from them and we can see that there's a repeated risk there, but it becomes harder to um, look at objectively in our own community when it's our homes or our neighbor's homes. Uh, and when we are really awash in all these different problems from financial to legal. 
So what this item would do um, is first of all, reach out to some of the folks who've recently suffered from disasters, CZU fire victims, flood victims. Uh, we know that almost half of all CZU fire victims have not initiated any rebuild action. And uh, it would, this, this would outreach would better understand what's preventing them from doing so. Of course, some of those things are completely outside of the county's control. Fire insurance rates going up, uh, under insurance to begin with, new state standards for septic or road widths. And then the other item that uh, would be included in this outreach is exploring the possibility for a legal tool called transfer development rights. This has been used in big cities like New York or Chicago or even San Francisco uh, to preserve historic properties and transfer the right to build from a historic property to another site. Uh, it's been used in places like Maryland to preserve farmland from uh, urban sprawl. And it's been used in Florida uh, to preserve Everglades and even in the Tahoe uh, lake region to preserve some um, the creeks and, and other sensitive environmental areas. Uh, so there's a p potential to use it here to allow people to rebuild in, on, on sites other than maybe where their home was originally and where it was destroyed and vulnerable uh, to sea level rise or storm, storm surges or the, within the floodplain uh, or vulnerable to fires. The survey is just a first step to see if it is something people would be interested in, if, it's, if we can use it here, uh, and if it's worth further investment um, in creating this policy resource. On item 27, a resolution in support of California property tax apportionment reform. I want to thank Supervisor Friend, Chair Friend, for partnering on this. You know, one of the uh, things I'm sure that uh, Supervisor Hernandez and Cummings realized in, the first, in their first budget season uh, is that our financial situation is a little bit more bleak than most people realize uh, from the outside. Uh, we're reminded of this pretty consistently. Um, I think most recently in a presentation by Assistant Director of Roads, uh, Steve Wiesner um, at the Transportation Commission, which said, you know, we really should be investing $24 million every year to keep our road network uh, in shape in just where it is today, if not improving it. And we're only investing $8 million, a third of what's needed. And that's a trend that cannot continue. I mean, our road network's already in poor condition. And unless we do something, it's basically going to fail. We have to reverse the trend line. And that's not just our road infrastructure. It's the same is true of uh, our other facilities. I mean, the, the very building we're sitting in, our health centers at Emmeline on uh, the Freedom Campus, uh, and our county parks. I mean, there's hundreds of millions of dollars of, of deferred maintenance between it all. Um, and it's to no fault of the county. It's simply because we get a lower share of our property taxes than most communities, 13.5% of every property tax, tax dollar that people pay uh, comes back to the county. And that's uh, less than 20%, but which is the statewide average. The difference is close to $70 million a year uh, in really discretionary funding that the county could be using to maintain our infrastructure uh, and directly invest in needed programs. So this ultimately is going to take a change in state legislation to uh, affect uh, the diff to make the difference. But I think right now we have, I think we could only be described as a dream team in the state legislature uh, between uh, senior members like uh, Senator Laird, uh, great new members like uh, Assembly Member Addis and uh, Gail Pellerin, and of course uh, the Speaker of the Assembly, Robert Rivas. Uh, who has a, a good share of Watsonville. So I think if there was ever a time to try to change this legislation, it's now. Uh, and I hope that with this resolution, we're taking the first step, uh, not only working and reaching out to our state legislature, but also working with other counties who are in a similar position. And finally, I just want to uh, applaud item 41, the Crisis Act Grant Family Service Agency Mobile Crisis Response Services. Uh, you know, I've said since uh, from the beginning of taking office that we really needed an alternative crisis response model uh, with 24-7 availability. I know lots of people in the community have asked for that. Um, and it's just fantastic to see us taking this concrete step towards actually staffing uh, that outreach. Uh, and of course, it comes on the heels of uh, the other um, initiative that we recently undertook um, using the Crisis Now Innovation Project Grant uh, to really coordinate services and ensure that when people call 911, we're going to dispatch the, the correct um, outreach service, including potentially this 24-7 uh, mobile crisis unit. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor McPherson.
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I have several, um, and some will repeat items. The number 26, the transfer of development rights program. I want to thank um, Supervisor Koenig for bringing this together with me uh, because we're trying to identify ways that uh, we want to help disaster victims recover and rebuild. And the transfer of development rights program is uh, what might be a very good option. We look forward to having a lot of input from the public on this proposal. Um, also on item 27, the support for California property tax apportionment reform, as was mentioned uh, in Chair Friend and, and Koenig brought this together. Um, we are really a low property tax, probably the lowest in the state uh, of what we, we get back, the 13 cents. Uh, and it's a big reason we often see more, more most of our uh, local tax measures. And we're going to see a lot of them this next year uh, in Santa Cruz County from one district or city or county to the other. And uh, we just seriously are into underfunded compared to other counties through no, no fault of our own. That was something that was put in place many, many years ago. But uh, uh, it'll take a lot of work and state cooper statewide cooperation for us to be able to increase that that uh, site. Um, and on a, item number thirty one, I, I will abstain from that item. Um, and I want to thank. Uh, it was also mentioned on item number forty one, the crisis uh, grant. Thank. I want to thank the Health Services Agency for pursuing this program and the Family Services Agency of the Central Coast for taking uh, on this pilot project as our partner. Um, it's important that we work toward ensuring that people experiencing behavioral health emergencies receive the most effective response and that law enforcement and fire responders are best utilized uh, for the kind of emergency that suit their services. On, on this item, I would like to, this is just going to go into effect. I, I would like to provide additional direction that the Health Services Agency return to the board within a year uh, after the contract is signed. And so that would probably be December of 2024 to provide an update on how this pilot program is progressing. Um, I think it's a tremendous program and I think it'd be good if we had a review of that uh, in a year from now or just over a year from now. Um, item number uh, 50, uh, this can't be overstated, a, a brief thank you, but a huge one for our Parks Department uh, for their uh, terrific work on the strategic plan. It's especially exciting to, uh, to read all of the great accomplishment for the five, uh, past five years. Uh, it's been really a wonderful to see the inclusion of uh, new spaces like Felton Discovery Park, uh, the uh, Leo's Haven, Live Oak, all with the department that just years ago uh, was not even its own entity. Um, and I see that Director Parks Director uh, Jeff Daphne is here. I, I just want to thank him and his whole staff for, and really a lot of community volunteers came to the front too on this, uh, who are responsible for the success of this. It was particularly important with our COVID crisis, which may not be over, it seems to be coming back and forth, but uh, having a great park system is a truly valuable asset to our Santa Cruz County. And they've done a phenomenal job of, shall we call it a comeback to uh, for the parks department and providing so many services. So I wanna thank them for that. Um, and on the uh, number 61, the Felton Sheriff substation lease, uh, this is a good opportunity for me once again to uh, thank Sheriff Jim Hart and the CAO, uh, Carlos Palacios, for their commitments to uh, keep the sheriff substations open uh, in various areas of the county. We now have substations in uh, the 5th District up in San Ronza Valley and Boulder Creek and Felton. Uh, it's really created great relationships and better response times, and people have a lot more confidence uh, that their law enforcement agency from the sheriff department will respond to San Lorenzo Valley. So thank you very much uh, for extending that substation release and film. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll speak to a few items uh, on item 27. Again, appreciation for Supervisor Koenig for bringing this item forward with our office in regards to the property tax apportionment. Um, our community pays tens of millions of dollars that doesn't actually stay with the unincorporated county because of a state formulation that was created in 1978. Uh, this is money that could be used for parks or public safety or for roads or for a number of other community-based services. And so uh, I think it's reasonable to take a look at a formula that, that's over 40 years old and, and clearly isn't serving the needs of our community very well in a lot of actual rural communities, uh, counties throughout the state of California that we intend to reach out to to see if there's an interest in working on changing the state legislation around this. I'm on item 29, appreciation of Supervisor Cummings on this 
item, even though this item is not in our county, as we know with the Pajaro and an item that we're going to be talking about later on the flood protection, uh, when you have environmental injustice issues, it's nice to have as many communities as possible amplifying the message uh, to both our state and federal delegation and leadership that uh, these issues need to be addressed. And this is a pretty significant environmental crisis occurring in the southern portion of our state, in particularly uh, impacting disadvantaged residents. On item 34, just appreciation for the board and supporting this uh, project Greenlight, which will support veterans that are returning to civilian life. Uh, we'll actually light our, our building here green during uh, the Veterans Day week. And so it is a way to acknowledge veterans that they are seen when they return back uh, to civilian life. Item 51, 52, and 53, which deal with the rail corridor, I need to recuse myself. I live within 500 feet of the rail corridor, so I have a personal, potential personal financial conflict on items regarding that. On item 63, just a brief question for council. Um, I'm in support of Supervisor Cummings' additions, but this is a resolution. So is this an item that, that needs to actually come back with the modifications, or is this something we can do today? Yeah, I would recommend that you... Um take a vote on the entire consent agenda other than 63 and then take up 63 in a second motion that just directs um, staff to come back with a revised resolution uh, on November 14th. And we'd be happy to do that. Okay. So I'm supportive of, of doing that and changing the directing staff to that on all new events. Um, the second you wanted an appeals process for denied events that it could come to the board. Um, also a reasonable, is that part of the resolution as well? Uh, yes, that would be, that would be when, when we come back, we'll put those two things that you want to see. The board wants to see, uh, first events and wants there to be some kind of an appeal process to the board. Okay. Is there a motion for the consent agenda with the additional direction on 41, the abstention on 31 from Supervisor McPherson, the recusal that was noted, I'm sure, for 51, 52, and 53, not including item 63? So moved. Second. So we have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Koenig. Madam Clerk, are we clear on what the motion is? Yes, we are. All right, we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? And friend? Aye. And on item 63, Supervisor Cummings, would you like to articulate the motion for the direction to come back? Sure, I'll move that item 63 come back with the revised resolution um, to give the board authority for approving new events, um, an appeals process for events that are rejected by staff, and repeat events to be approved by staff. Is there a second? Second. And that, as a point of clarification, to come back on November 14th, correct? And to come back on November 14th. And I apologize, I missed who was the second? Supervisor McPherson? Okay. So we have a motion from Supervisor Cummings, a second from Supervisor McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? Aye. And friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously, and that'll end the consent agenda, and we'll move on to our first item of the regular agenda. We are gonna combine items seven and eight. They are related items for the presentation purposes. Do we need to take the motion separately though, council, in regards to it, or can they also be taken as all one? You have discretion to combine the items and then uh, whatever motions come out of the combined items uh, will track. Sounds good. All right, so seven and eight will be combined and we could most likely take that into one motion. Um, we can begin with a presentation, Ms. Coburn, welcome. Good morning, um, Chair Friend and members of the board. I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant CAO, and I'm joined today by Rita Sanchez, who is Assistant County Clerk. Together, we've worked on the Santa Cruz County Like Me project, and we'll be presenting both items seven and eight on today's agenda. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge um, a few folks who have contributed to this work. First, Ventures, which partnered with us on understanding who serves on the county's boards and commissions. The Santa Cruz County Like Me Committee, which facilitated community conversations over the summer and dived into the data. Um, our intern, Chaska Farber, who spent three months researching county commissions, preparing for county conversations on commission restructuring and analyzing potential stipends. Chief Assistant County Counsel Ruby Marquez, who incorporated committee and staff feedback to update Chapter 2.38. And our Chief Deputy Clerk, Juliet Burke, who has created more structure and better systems for supporting staff liaisons and new commissioners. So with that, um, 
And I'll go to the next slide. All right. Um, so at the October 3rd meeting, as you are aware, the board adopted a statement on equity as shown here. Um, we want to let you know that the work of the Santa Cruz County Like Me project embodies this statement as, and in, is an extension of that work. The recommendations that we're going to present and ask the board to approve are a step forward in ensuring intentional opportunities and access, fostering an environment where everyone can thrive and belong. The recommendations don't encompass everything that we want to do, but establish specific actions to begin to transform representation on county boards and commissions. We fully intend to return with additional recommendations. So this is our agenda for the presentation. We're going to start by talking about the Santa Cruz County Like Me project, and then we're gonna to transition to the chapter 2.38 updates. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rita Sanchez. Good morning, Chair and Board. Um, as Nicole mentioned, I'll be presenting on the Santa Cruz Like Me uh, project and the community engagement results. In 2021, the County Administrative Office partnered with Santa Cruz Community Ventures to survey the composition of county boards and commissions and its representation of the county's population to ensure that policy is informed by diverse voices. The survey led to the a Santa Cruz Like Me report which highlighted critical variances between the demographic makeup of commission members and county residents. Specifically, the report highlighted underrepresentation from residents who reside within the 95076 zip code, who self-identify as renters, identify as Hispanic or Latino, or identify as having a disability. The report also highlighted no young adult representation in the makeup of county commissioners, and overrepresentation of college graduates as compared to county population. That same year, the board accepted the report along with the recommendations within it, which included the creation of a committee to review the variances and propose solutions. CAO staff began the work of establishing the committee in 2022. And over the past year, we've had the privilege of working alongside Antonio Rivas, current member of the Mental Health Advisory Board, the Seniors Commission, and former Watsonville Mayor. Cesar DeSantos, current member of the Latino Affairs Commission and Santa Cruz County Deputy. Elaine Johnson, current member of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission and Executive Director of Housing Santa Cruz County. Karina Moreno, current member of the Human Services Commission, the Women's Commission, and Program and Leadership Coordinator at Milpa Collective. Mireya Gomez Contreras, Deputy Director at the Arts Council, Santa Cruz County, and Administrative Co-Leader of Esperanza Community Farms. And Yadira Flores, current, current member of the Latino Affairs Commission and Parks Activities Designer with County Park Friends. And if the committee members are here, I'd like to ask them to please stand so we can recognize them. The committee and CAO staff conducted initial factor analysis work to identify current um, county practices and activities that could be potentially contributing to the current disparities and engaged with community leaders to inform them of the work that was being done and obtain their feedback. And this includes the Circle on Anti-Racism, Economic and Social Justice Group or CARES J. And recognizing that community experience and voice were key to validating any factor analysis results, the committee and CAO staff designed and facilitated several community engagement activities. Community engagement efforts consisted of an online survey in both English and Spanish, which was launched in June for about six weeks. Um, close to 100 community members throughout the county responded to the survey, which gathered data on community interest in commissions and the resources and support needed to increase participation. Additionally, three community workshops were conducted during the month of June. And each workshop provided bilingual materials, Spanish interpretation, childcare, a light meal, and a gift card to uh, participants. Two workshops were held in Watsonville and one workshop was held in Capitola. And the objective of the workshops was to facilitate conversations around county commissions and their purpose, including how and why to participate, 
to discuss the lack of representation and how this impacts the community and to hear about the resources or support needed from the community. And finally, the county and city of Santa Cruz collaborated to present their work on representational government during an online coffee core chat in September with a similar objective. And the chat was attended by over 25 participants representing local organizations. Both the survey and workshops asked participants about the resources and support needed for their participation in county commissions. And the online survey participants identified the following top needs increased awareness on why to participate, financial support such as stipends, information on where to apply or learn more, and resources such as childcare, and accessibility of meetings, locations, and times. And this can be seen on the graph on the left. South County workshop participants identified similar needs with accessible meeting times and locations rising to the top followed by stipends, community outreach to raise awareness on why to participate, and childcare resources. And the graph on the right shows the results from the Watsonville Art Center workshop, uh, since it was the most well-attended workshop, and participants were the most representative of our target audience, which was South County young adults between the ages of 18 and 24, who identified as Hispanic Latino, um, identified as rate renters, and self-identified as having a disability. And Nicole will touch on the recommendations that were informed by this data later in the presentation. But I will mention now that providing accessible meeting times and locations, including the ability to hold virtual meetings, is being addressed internally by staff through the work of the clerk of the board to provide structure and support to staff liaisons and new commissioners, as well as through county's legislative efforts. The data from the online survey and workshops, workshops was informative in validating the committee's prior work and informing the recommendations to address current disparities. But we believe that the most meaningful and revealing part of the workshops were the conversations with the community, which brought up some important themes um, listed on the screen. And I'll touch on a few of them. Um, alternative forms of outreach was one common theme. CAO staff used multiple social media outlets and relied on community-based organizations to help promote the workshops, but it was the work of committee members and community leaders acting as trusted messengers that really got people to show up. Another common theme was youth engagement, engaging youth early and often, collaborating with schools and colleges, creating mentorship programs were part of conversations had at each of the workshops. And one more theme I'd like to highlight was around the transformative process of building relationship and trust. And I want to take a moment to thank each community member that participated for their openness, honesty, and trust in us during the workshops. And I'd like to read some of what was shared by folks when asked at the end of the workshops, what needs to happen next? Provide information about what commissions do. How would a new person joining be supported? Incluir a los menores de edad, incluir a gente como yo. Include young adults, include people like me. There needs to be changes to make commissions more welcoming so those who join don't feel so lost. Advertise the meetings for more participation and awareness on how people can make changes to their community by participating in commissions. And these last two um, comments from community members really stood out because they touch on relationship and trust through the act of commitment and accountability. Seguir teniendo estas pláticas con la gente para informarles de este compromiso con la comunidad. Continue to have these conversations with people to inform them of this commitment to the community. Proponerse una meta para ustedes que les comprometan para servir la comunidad. Propose a goal for yourselves that shows your commitment to serve the community. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nicole to talk about the recommendations. Okay. So the Santa Cruz County Like Me Committee ended up focusing on the top three needs identifying through the survey um, that Rita went over and they used these needs to uh, develop their recommendations. In addition, because youth participation was a predominant theme at all three workshops, one of their recommendations is targeted at youth. 
So their first recommendation deals with establishing a youth advisory task force. As you heard, uh, many, community, many community members expressed a need to involve youth early and early on in local government. The committee agrees with this. They recommend the creation of a youth advisory task force supported by CAO staff. Over an 18 month period, the task force would be charged with reviewing youth participation within commissions and proposing recommendations for increased involvement of diverse young adults between the ages of 14 and 24. Their work would address the potential creation of a youth commission, designated at large youth positions on existing commissions, continuation or expansion of the Young Supervisors Academy and other forms of youth participation in county government. Recommendation two has to do with outreach and education. Many workshop participants also shared with us that they were not aware of county commissions and the opportunities available to participate, as Rita just discussed. The workshop succeeded in increasing awareness and engagement. Um, participants left energized and committed, and many voiced the need for more. To raise the bar on community awareness and outreach of county commissions, the committee recommends the creation of outreach and education activities and policies that are actionable and focused on increasing diverse and inclusive government bodies. CAO staff are currently looking into creating an annual commissions workshop that would be held over the winter before spring appointments and reappointments are made. The third recommendation has to do with commissioner referrals. During workshops, many participants shared that they were already involved with nonprofit groups at school sites and local organizations. Participants mentioned that working with community organizations to identify community members who would be interested in participating in commissions and building out what, could, what exists could be a good start. The committee recommends the county create a framework for partnering with local organizations that leads to an active interest list of community residents and creates a pipeline of referrals from the community to local government. The final recommendation from the committee relates to onboarding and mentoring. While workshop participants were interested in learning more about commissions and many were inclined to join, and we actually had a couple pursue applications, there were concerns about the support and guidance that would be provided to new commissioners, especially participants from underrepresented groups. Participants shared that onboarding and mentoring focused on the needs of underrepresented groups would be necessary resource and support for continued participation. The clerk of the board continues to work on a phased project to provide standard onboarding procedures and guidelines for new commission members. While this is important work, we heard from commissioners that more needs to be done. The committee recommends that staff support new commissioners through onboarding and mentoring, such as exploring the creation of a mentor buddy program that addresses the specific needs of members from underrepresented groups. And with that, um, I also want to transition into um, a proposal for a commissioner stipend program. On April 25th, the board directed us to return on today's agenda with a proposal for commissioner compensation to help increase diverse commissioner participation. The board also included $70,000 in the fiscal year 23-24 budget to help support efforts to increase diversity on commissions. Stipends were identified, as you heard, as a necessary resource among workshop participants. Um, the county has over 40 commissions, committees, and advisory bodies. About 11 of these already offer a stipend or are governed by an outside group. Existing stipends range from $30 to $200 per meeting, and we included a table in our staff report that outlines what they are. This leaves about 29 commissions to be included in the stipend program. We're recommending a stipend of $75 per meeting for, for community members who are not currently employees of the county or other public agencies and make less than the median household income of $115,000. And this would be done through self-certification. Um, self-certification is a low barrier form of achieving this where commissioners can state whether they make less than the county median household income and wish to opt in or whether they wish to opt out because they don't meet that threshold or for some other reason. Based on available information, the stipend would benefit approximately half of current commissioners or about 113 members. The proposed stipend aligns with what we found both within the county and our research um, in other counties and allows the implementation of the program within the board approved budget of $70,000.
There are additional steps needed to operationalize the stipend. So assuming the board approves this proposal, um, we have county code changes in chapter 2.38, where we actually have language in there to, to allow for a stipend that you would be approving that in concept today. And we would be bringing back that for adoption on November 14th. There would also be a board resolution that would be needed that would authorize the stipend and potentially contain other details. And there might also need to be a county policy. So we would be bringing back the resolution and the policy in December. In addition, while not an official direction, the board asked us to review the county commission structure, including staff and fiscal resources dedicated to supporting commissions. Over the past five months, we have collected information on county boards and commissions to create an inventory of their authority, membership, meeting frequency, and departmental support. Based on this research, we've learned um, a number of things. One, county staff provide an average of 13 hours of support as liaisons to commissions. The position of a staff liaison varies widely across the county, anywhere from an administrative aide to the director of environmental health. The annual fiscal impact of staff resources allocated to maintaining commissions is close to $200,000. Some of the major challenges faced when staffing these commissions were obtaining a quorum and filling vacant seats, as well as engaging commissioners in being productive and purposeful rather than performative. About 240 non-employee county residents serve on those commissions. The majority of these commissions advise the board on topics related to housing, environmental planning, and land use issues. Due to the board's interest in restructuring commissions, we have met with department heads and staff liaisons to discuss our ideas for restructuring. These conversations have been very informative, but we need a bit more time to continue planning and coordinating with departments and commissions. Um, they appreciate that they've been included in these conversations. We anticipate presenting a variety of recommendations beginning in January that include commission consolidations, particularly related to some of those housing, environmental planning, and land use commissions, retirements of various commissions, particularly commissions that rarely or never meet, and transitions of committees to other methods of accomplishing the same purpose or duties, such as appeals that can be handled through our administrative hearing process. So with that, I'm going to um, wrap up and show you the recommendations for item seven um, shown here and move on to the chapter 2.38 updates. So with this, I coordinated, we coordinated closely with county council um, based on all of the feedback and information we heard um, that we just presented, as well as working with staff on uh, various um, clarifications that need to be made. Mm -hmm. The changes to chapter 2.38 that have to do with the Santa Cruz County Like Me project um, are in particular the youth members. Um, we added language to suggest that youth over the age of 14 may be able to serve on commissions. This, this will require the board to just help us decide which commissions that involves. So there is language in there that says that it is determined by the board. We hope that this can also be done in collaboration with the Youth Advisory Task Force that we have recommended to you. In addition to the youth new youth language, um, we've also made some updates to, uh, to clarify that election of a co-chair person may be made in lieu of a vice chairman, and also officers um, are limited to up to two consecutive years, um, and there's an annual election of commission officers. As previously mentioned, um, the updates include the language to allow the board to establish by resolution a stipend for commission members for compensation um, for their public service. The clarification items have to do with the changes to definitions, adding bylaws and staff liaisons, um, clarifying that there is to be a calendar designating the time and place of regular meetings, clarifying the duties of staff liaisons, as well as the vacancy process and clarifying ethical obligations and codes of conduct. Advisory has also been replaced throughout the county code chapter 2.38 to with um, the word subordinate to differentiate between subordinate bodies such as commission and committees and advisory bodies such as departmental advisory groups. So with that, these are the recommendations for item eight related to the chapter 2.38 update, updates. And we're happy to answer any of your questions. 
are there questions before we open it up for the community on this? Uh, Supervisor Hernandez. Yeah, you know, I I was um I liked all the recommendations. I was looking at the uh, times and locations, and I think for a lot of folks in South County, I think location might be first. So it's location and times, because of, you know most most of the time, you know, a normal nine o'clock meeting first in in Watsonville, you know, it's like you start your day at eight or something. Unless you got kids, you start it at five a.m. But if it's a meeting in in North County, it's a 6 a.m. start time just to get ready to make it here on time. Uh, we made it at 8.22 and we left at 7 to, uh, today, for example. So you really, you know, do start a lot earlier and you, and you also, you know, have to spend a lot more gas as well. You know, it's six bucks a gallon and it's like 20 bucks a trip. Um, so it's good to look into those things, you know, taking it, taking into account, uh, the drive time over here, um, a huge inconvenience of a 9 a.m. meeting for folks to travel here for commission meetings or even 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. because there's still traffic till noon, um, here in, in, uh, going to, to Santa Cruz. And I think some of the, some of the, uh, telecommuting meetings or South County meetings or being able to rotate the meetings from North County to South County uh, is a great idea uh, for folks. Uh, if not some type of additional stipend for uh, travel time to get to Santa Cruz, if the meetings are going to remain in Santa Cruz, right? Um, for folks in, in, in South County, if there's no way for them to actually change the meetings to rotate or to have them in Santa Cruz or to telecommute to actually pay some kind of additional travel pay for folks that are having to do those meetings. Um, you know, I think that there initially when we started the, the, the young supervisors, um, I was a little worried that we weren't going to get the turnout for the students. Uh, we only had, I think nine days to let folks know and surprisingly, we had like 19 applicants and we had to turn some away, actually. Uh, some were out of the district um, and some were out of the county, Monterey County. Uh, but, you know, we ended up with 14, 15 students um, and we had the opportunity to actually have a segment to talk about uh, commissioners and the roles of commissioners and just the whole gamut, right? From commission to council to board members and uh, assembly. So it was good to have them there and have them kind of see that um, at a young age to participate that with that and talk to other commissioners as well. Um, so I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing, but I, my, my question was about considering some sort of travel pay for meetings that can't be moved to South County, can't be uh, tell, you know, through Zoom or something. Yeah, that was not um, something we looked into, but we are happy to research that. I don't think anything like that is currently offered across, you know, any of the counties in California. Um, I would hope that we would be able to provide um, more meetings throughout the county so that it's more equitably distributed. I just, I was just wondering because my, I think it's off. I. I think it's not staying on. There it is. I think two of my commissions that I go to as a, as a board member actually do pay the travel time. I think it's Embard and Ambag. So was, I was just wondering if, you know, this was considered as part of this study. Chair, sure. Supervisor Koenig. Yeah, I'll just uh, um, to, to build on Supervisor Hernandez's comments, um, certainly it'll, it'll be helpful when we have 500 Westridge as a place for some of these commissions to meet, uh, a South County location. Um, and maybe we can look at you know encouraging commissions to meet in a South County location in the morning um, so that people go in there and not fighting traffic. Um, and the other thing is that there, you know, I know some of the teleconferencing rules are a bit confusing uh, right now since we're sort of operating under two sets of rules. Um, the one to from 
pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, but in some ways, actually, the pre-pandemic rules offer a little bit more flexibility. And as long as there is a quorum of the commission in one location, um, you could have one or you know multiple members um, dialing in uh, via the old teleconference rules from another location. And so it's possible, again, that you could have uh, you know, a South County contingent um, calling into these commission meetings uh, from you know, a, a any location. I mean, it could be the library or, or 500 Westridge, but that might be something just to include in the um, onboarding and educational elements for these commissions and um, encourage. I have a, a few comments, but I am interested in, in getting the feedback again from the community on it. Um, just looking at the survey and the in-person results, the accessible meeting times and locations, the awareness is why to participate, I think are real key takeaways here. Uh, even though I recognize that the stipend element will, is going to be the thing that is the greatest focus, the number one issue people were talking about was accessibility to these meetings. And to me, um, to Supervisor Koenig's point and Supervisor Hernandez's point, as the county moves forward with a consolidation or a restructuring of commissions, I mean, part of this is we need to know what commissions will even exist for this discussion. I think that we're sort of a little bit backwards on this discussion. It'd be useful to know what commissions there are going to be, what they're going to look like, what their purposes are going to be. If the number one reason or number two reason that people are not participating in commissions is because they don't know why they should participate in the commission as they self-stated, then it'd be useful to have only commissions that serve a purpose, a clearly defined purpose that people feel value in. With that said, we should have locations under our current structure in South County that don't require people to have to travel at all, irrespective of where it's quote unquote being hosted. We've got a government building that we can partner with in the city of Watsonville currently. We've got the Westridge building coming on. We just need to, from a technological standpoint, need to make sure that this is something that's provided. But it's not just South County. I mean, I have a handful of seniors that participate in commissions in my district that um, are uncomfortable traveling at night. They're uncomfortable driving in traffic in general and would like to be able to participate remotely. And we shouldn't be... Um, creating any rules and this is a very important takeaway in my opinion from this we shouldn't be making any changes that also disadvantage other populations if the point here is expanding access we shouldn't discriminate against any subpopulation in regards to that we should only be finding ways to expand access in and i have a concern with some of the recommended actions that they are not thinking broadly about how something a decision on one end would impact a subpopulation on another end that may currently be participating we just have to be careful that is, we make changes to commission structure or meeting times or meeting locations that we're not uh, also disadvantaging other folks from being able to participate, because I don't think that's the goal of the board. Um, I had a question, though, in regards to there's a recommendation here about allowing in April or the nearest meeting near April, the commissions to choose their meeting times and, and locations. And I think that consistency of when a commission meets is kind of an important element for somebody wanting to join a commission. When we make appointments, um, I make 62 appointments for commissions here and on other bodies. So it's, you know, in and of itself, like a secondary part-time job to maintain those being full. The first question I get is, when do they meet? Where do they meet? And if every April that's being changed at the whim of the commission, that's a problem, I think, for trying to establish that when someone might, for me, the last two commissioners that stepped down we had child care issues. If, the, if I couldn't give them a consistent answer of when or where the, the meetings would be, that'd be problematic. So I want the commissions to have some flexibility, but we need to have some stability as well within that. So the question was, Coburn, how would you recommend then that we provide additional direction on that issue in order to ensure that there is a consistency in these meeting times so we don't end up actually removing members from the commissions that would normally be able to meet in these times. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, my understanding is a lot of the commissions have general you know, guidance in their bylaws as to when and where they meet. Um, I know of, you know, like for instance, the Justice and Gender Commission um, incorporated that into its bylaws. Um, there are some commissions that are changing the locations, you know, every year when they set their calendar. If we want to provide more consistency and structure, I would suggest that we as staff 
could, um, as we're doing all of this commission um, support work through bringing staff liaisons into with us and providing them with the tools and guidance to um, better set up their commissions and support their commissioners, we could either look at making working with all of them um, to make sure that that's documented in their bylaws and or setting something up as we're exploring county policy and procedure that might need to be established related to commissions, putting that into that document as well. So um, I think that's something that staff can work on and we can figure out the best way to make that consistency, um, bringing that forward. So you wouldn't need specific directions saying that that would be something you'd be able to bring back that would- I permit. believe so. So on the on the thank you on the on the commissioner stipend issue, I do um, I'm supportive of the stipend. I'm not supportive of the um, of the self certification. So you would you'd mention that it's a low barrier. I would submit that research has made it really clear that those that are the least likely to participate in any sort of self certification or, or language barrier issues. Those are non English speakers, uh, low income folks, etc. I would rather see for me that this is just a pure opt-out, that it applies to all commissioners and you have an opt-out. It's a much easier way for staff to actually implement it. And two, it removes all barriers. We shouldn't have a low barrier. We should have no barrier. Either we're trying to increase access or not. And so I think that we should move, um, we should change that direction to eliminate any sort of income or means component to it, eliminate any sort of certification where anybody's making any claim about their uh, income on it. Um, uh, which I think is is a barrier in general. So I would hope that when when it comes back to the board for that action, we just allow it to be a stipend. If somebody doesn't want to receive it, then they have an opt out capability. But they're not making a certification, whether they're low income or not low income, about the money they make. I think it's 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 uncomfortable to me to have to. I always dislike that when it came to broadband or anything else that I had to say to people, I don't make enough money for it. I mean, it's it feels like it's a barrier. We shouldn't have the barrier. We should just remove the income component and just say that your time and service are valued and you're going to get $75 associated with it unless you proactively say that you don't want it. So, but that would require the board to make that modification. Um, I'd like to open it up now for the community. It's an opportunity for members of the community to address this on this item. I know a number of you work very hard on this and we appreciate the work that you've done on this. Good morning and welcome back. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is Maria Cadenas. I'm the executive director of Ventures, and we were very proud to partner with the county in the efforts around a Santa Cruz like me. At Ventures, we work with working class families um, to ensure shared and equitable economic future where zip code, race, gender, or immigration status that does not dictate income or wealth. And we are honored to partner with the report of Santa Cruz like me, whose main intention was really to bring a uh, visibility and inform and shape the policy and governance for the county in ways that ensure diverse lived experiences had a say and how we move forward. This work reflects this county's commitment to creating a healthy, safe, and more affordable community that is culturally diverse, economically inclusive, and environmentally vibrant. Over the past year, we have seen clear steps taken to address the report's four recommendations, which included creating a community to review the variances and propose solutions, require collection of demographic information, include county data review as part of the onboarding process and work with cities like the city of Santa Cruz in conducting a similar study. We understand that change is not easy, nor simple, nor fast, which is why today's recommendations are good first steps. They allow for a vehicle to increase youth participation, facilitate participation of working class families through the stipend, support education and outreach to community members to increase awareness of opportunities. But most importantly, it formalizes a commitment to review and address the structural changes within county boards commissions framework. As stated, change is not simple, nor easy, nor fast, but it is possible. We applaud the work of the county to date on this important matter. We ask that you continue this journey as difficult as it may seem at times, to ensure Santa Cruz continues his leadership in modeling a way to move forward as an equitable representative government. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning. My name is Yadira Flores and I'm here to say that during the work with the Santa Cruz Like Me Committee, we were able to identify practices and activities that contribute to our current dis dispairs. We have done the job 
the field job for you. And we promise to continue with this work with the community. It is important to have the trust from the community because it's crucial to have a to it's crucial to better serve the community. And today I would like to invite you to take the time to deeply listen and know the community that you serve. Your community is incredible, incredible smart. They will bring the needs to you, but also they will propose possible solutions. Once Salvador Allende says, being young, young and not being revolutionary is, an, is a biological contradiction. Our youth are the future and will determine the future of our com community and our country. Let's include them and mentor them for the well-being of all of us. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your work on this. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. I'm Katie Spencer. I'm a program coordinator at Ventures. Um, and I'm just here to comment on the Sanford's Like Me item, add more to the voices that are supporting this work. Um, this is a great step forward in creating more, represent, more representative advisory committees, boards, and city processes. I think so often in this county, we sort of wring our hands between the gap between what we all say we value and what the reality is for working people here. And true representation in our commissions and city processes is one of many ways to start to close this gap. As Maria said, this is going to continue to be a journey. Thank you all for your work. And I look forward to continued focus and potentially additional recommendations as we prioritize this important work. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning. I wanna thank Rita and Nicole for taking this opportunity a year ago and gathering the group of us that spent the last 12 months really diving deep into looking at how we can shift the culture and how um, individuals join the commission. Um, I would like to invite you to adopt most of the recommendations that was that was presented here. I, I do did hear what you, each of you had to share and I respect that. But I think what, and I think what is most important is that if we're really going to stand in what we say we stand in, which is equity and inclusion, then we really have to put that in action. And right now, currently, there's a lot of commissions where there is not representation and, and there hasn't been any space to create that access for representation. And so I think it's critically important as the county continues to, you know, stand in and, and say they want to shift in how things have been done, that really now is the time. And, 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 I, and I say that seriously, that right now is really the time to start making space at the tables for people that are under, underrepresented, people that don't look like you, to, to have that voice, because those of us who, who are not invited to the tables a lot are the ones that can actually offer a lot more than people that are already currently at the tables. And I think the, the way, the best way to make change is to have different perspectives. And so I highly encourage you to sit, um, support some of the recommendations that we had this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your work on this. Good morning, welcome back. Yeah, good morning. It's nice to be back. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I appreciate the presentation. I appreciate the public comments. Um, we don't have a representational government, you know? It's like trying to uh, balance uh, pool cues and bowling balls and golf balls on a hill. You're not gonna balance them. Uh, what's going on right now is a Delphi technique. And it's very similar. Everything's being controlled in the past. You know, people assume that the word democracy is in our Declaration of Independence or in any of our three constitutions. Now, it is mentioned several times in our constitutions. It's mentioned not to do that because that's mob rule. These gentlemen are controlled by city and county managers. What kind of examples are you really setting, Zach, friend, with that mask? It's got to say it. You're wearing it. So here, for example, up to six months in jail, our city model creator restricts the elected officials from carrying on the wishes of the voters. Section 809 reads, no interference between county and the city manager. So we don't really have a rep representative government. I think the people here speaking on the other side of the podium and the speakers have great intentions, but if they were actually educated on what the Declaration of Independence actually says and interpretations of our constitution, there might be some different languages going on. And I'll stay on topic, so I won't bring up anything else. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. 
Thank you so much. My name is Tim Delaney. I've been here a couple of times and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experience with uh, Placer County last night, which also relates to you folks here in Santa Cruz County as well. I heard, I heard a lot of like equitable, you know, affordable, you know, achievable, you know, it's interesting to watch, you know, all these different people, they come in and it's a tactic and I'll turn it over to you. And they dominate this discussion here. And it's an ongoing, never ending slideshow. I felt horrible for the, you know, Placer County board folks. I was like, oh my gosh, how could these people possibly sit in the seat for so long? It went on all day long. And anyways, uh, you know, one of the things I, I sort of, at the end of the meeting, I mentioned to them, well, you could have an af affordable, achievable, equitable, tiny boat and expand the boat fields, you know, the buoy fields out in Lake Tahoe. And we can have affordable toilets for all the boats out on Tahoe. The thing is, is, you know, in the engineering and scientific community here, we're trapped between the very far right and very far left. And you even see it in other countries like Argentina, for example, okay? You have your environment and you had just like Tahoe, you have limited resources, okay? All these people are making all these demands on your environment. They want to build and build and build and have all this achievable, affordable everything. They're going to wipe out their environment, okay? So that's something to think about. Also, on the other side of the world, you know that they built 3.1 billion units for 1.4 billion people in China, okay? So that's coming your way. So whatever you do, I hope that you have some common sense in regards to zoning codes and you think about your environment and you don't wipe out your community with all these agendas. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Buenos dias, my name is Karina Moreno and I'm a commissioner and constituent of District 4. Um, and también, I was, I was really happy to be a part of this committee. It was a year long um, process to get it to you, a year long and an hour and 20 minute drive to get to you today. Um, and it was amazing, you know, being able to not just bring in my work as a commissioner, but my experience starting out as a commissioner, which wasn't easy. You know, there's there's not a lot of pipelines from the community to commissioner. There's not a lot of mentors. There's not a lot of places where you can learn what that entails. And, and it's quite a daunting task, to be very honest. And so I appreciate you sitting and listening to these recommendations and already coming up with really great ideas and opening your purse strings wider and, and you know, being an inspiration with the, with the Youth Academy. Um, and I think if you take one thing too from, from what we heard about the Academy and, and what we learned at these workshops from community members is that there is so much interest for people wanting to participate. It is just learning how and providing those opportunities and so i appreciate you and, and i thank you for for listening and and also i i tuned in two weeks ago um at the equity meeting and i really i just in person wanted to say i appreciated the way you guys um what you guys had to say for that one too and so i appreciate everything you guys have been doing in terms of equity and, and i look forward to what comes out of this partnership thank you thank you thanks for taking the time Morning, welcome back. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Antonio Rivas. Probably everybody knows. Yeah, um, it is. Uh, I want to thank the board, the county board, for, in a sense, um, asking the the county staff to to be able to review the county commissions. It's an important uh, the change that we're doing right now, and and also at the same time to the county staff can be able to include, um, you know, the staff that needs to be deal with the commissions along with uh, fiscal resources. It's very important to include whatever we do. It is important that as part of the uh, the committee that I participated, I went to the one in Capitola, the one in, and the county over there in Marshall, and also in the city of Watsonville. It was so great to hear and feel and understand why they don't involve, they don't get involved 
in commissions. So these changes that are, are very important. The stipend is very important. The time is very important. Location is very important in this matter. But now we have them. Um, we can have South County, Mid County. Now that we have Apple's Library. Maybe we can use the Mid County part of it. And then we got the, the North County. So it's important that we be able to get involved, everybody in these commissions. And I appreciate the staff, Nicole, for putting this together. It's very important you to understand why we need to change the structure of the commissions and the importance of the commissions and the people that serve the commissions. Because we have a lot of talented youth and different areas. And I appreciate uh, Supervisor Hernandez for starting the young supervisors um, uh, training. It's important that we get involved in well. Thank you, Mr. All of you should. I'm sorry. So, so in conclusion, I support this recommendation, the stipend, location, and everything else, and continue to restructure. Eventually, it's going to come out, but it's important that we get more yeah. equity within the commissions. And I thank you thank for you. your support. Is there anybody else like to address us in chambers? Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? Yes, Chair. Call in user two. Your microphone's now available. Carolyn Garrett, this is an important discussion. And to quote you, Zach Friend, you said we should have expanding access and have no barriers to access. A friend of mine was on the Seniors Commission that met in the building where you are. The radiation from all the Wi-Fi antennas, et cetera, on the roof made her sick, and she had to get off the commission. The first thing is you should have safe and healthy environments in which to meet. And radiating people causes functional impairment that many of us are aware of and are therefore denied access. So this is hypocrisy. Um, in, in you want things more exclusionary, remove the Wi-Fi and antenna of radiation endangerment. This is well documented. Um, and um, also, what is represented are the corporations. This isn't a government of form by the people. It's supposed to be, but it's of form by the corporations who you actually vote for every time in terms of cell towers, et cetera. Another way the public is exploded, excluded is commenting on consent agenda items. You have a false statement here on your agenda. Consent items include routine business that does not call for discussion. Only you five male supervisors discuss the consent agenda. It should be everyone can comment like at the city council and like it used to be here. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. That is. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there any other? Members online? Yes. Bernie, your microphone is now available. Good morning, Chair and Board. Uh, Bernie Gomez here, uh, born and raised in Watsonville, currently District 3 constituent. Um, and uh, I just want to, let me see, um, just read the equity statement once again. You know, I've been reading it since it was adopted. You know, equity in action in San Cruz County is a transformative process that embraces individuals of every status, providing unwavering support, dignity, and compassion. Um, you know, historically, South County has uh, been underrepresented, right? Um, overrepresented in some spaces. Um, and I think this is just a great opportunity to really think about uh, just the, that equity portion, you know, uh, South County does have its share of um, willing 
individuals, right, that uh, uh, have been thinking maybe, you know, been uh, uh, wanting to get involved, but um, it's daunting to want to get involved in this in this process, you know, in the in this way of of uh, governance and, and uh, the way it's being led, you know. So I just think uh, there is room to provide, I don't know, being you know provide creativity eh, to engage uh, folks that are uh, usually never seen or don't see themselves in these uh, in these places or positions or spaces. You know, um, it was very. Uh, it, it was very heartfelt to see an intergenerational space in South County uh, being, you know, um, yeah, getting involved, being interested, being curious, you know, asking questions, answering questions. And um, and I just think that uh, representation is necessary when uh, historically uh, South County has been uh, left alone, forgotten or dismissed. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate what everything is being done. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Kayla, your microphone is now available. Hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and also uh, for everybody who, who came out uh, to speak on this item. My name is Kayla Gomez and I'm a constituent of District 3 and previously um, I worked at Ventures where I worked on this report uh, from 2021 and the city report that came out in 2022. And I just really wanted to thank everybody who worked on this effort um, to the committee, all the county folks, Brita, Nicole, for moving this work forward, uh, for Maria Cadenas for trusting me to help with it uh, when we first um, partnered with the county. And I really hope that the county will continue to this data collection and also continue to put thought and intention into looking at what can be done to create a more equitable and inclusive government that really reflects the beautiful diversity that we have. Um, and to really consider these recommendations brought forth by the committee who's taken the time and the care to engage with community members, not only through this effort, through these events, um, through these engagement events, but in their community roles. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, I'd like to bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Hernandez, you had additional comments? Yes. So do we move this uh, update item right now? Is that, can I make the motion now? You could, I would okay. like, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Oh, I was just asking. Yeah. So we, the only, the only request I have from a, a motion change, because it sounds like the other direction was just things that staff would incorporate in it regards specifically to this type. And I think it should just be an opt out and we eliminate the means test component of it. That, that would actually require a, a change of the recommended actions. So then I'll just move this first item, number seven. They're combined items. Yeah. They're combined items. So you'd, you'd move them both at the same time. And if you want to make a change to any of the recommended actions, this would also be the time to do it. Chair, I can try. So I, I would like to move and approve the updates on agenda item seven with the tangents one through five of Santa Cruz Like Me project and improve into item eight, as well as uh, the ordinance amendments, and can take in consideration the uh, state the amendments that Chair Zach Friend mentioned, and also possibly the travel amendments. Is that correct? We might have more. Uh, I would have, what, what was the other ones? Well, um, I would point out that actually I was just reading the ordinance language in order to double check that, um, you know, if we needed to actually change that. I think that it says that the board of supervisors may approve additional stipends for travel. Um, so there is some language already in there um, that suggests we could okay. uh, add that onto the program. Um, I think it just, we just need the specificity on um, item seven, recommended action three, that um, there would simply be an opt out for the stipends. Okay. So the recommended opt out for the stipends. But there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Is there an understanding? I, we're, we're not going to vote quite yet. Um, so is there an understanding from the clerk of what the motion actually is? Just one moment, Chair. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that removing items seven and eight, as stated with the exception of additional direction to change to an opt out instead of the cell certification. That's what it is. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Supervisor Cummings. I just wanted to thank um, the staff for their hard work on this and for all the community members who were able to 
um, help us get to where we are today and help us move forward with really trying to have a more equitable opportunity for people to participate on commissions. Um, since being elected, I've served on a number of different boards like AMBAG and LAFCO. And um, I was always, it was nice to see that we got a little stipend, you know, especially when we'd have to drive from here to Marina and back on certain days. And sometimes those meetings wouldn't even be longer than a half an hour. But, um, you know, having that stipend really helped at least feel like, well, at least I'm getting compensated something for my time. And so to be able to do that, to be able to provide this opportunity for um, members of the public to serve on our commissions, I think will really go along long way for them to feel that um, that their time is valued. Um, in addition to that, I'm really um, grateful to see that we're trying to see how we can make meetings um, more accessible for folks. And I share the, some of the comments that um, Supervisor Friend brought up around um, accessibility because um, uh, for some, for example, having meetings at night may be good for not having it interfere with your workday, but for others, maybe that's a hindrance because of the fact that they, you know, some people don't want to drive at night or can't. So to the extent that we can continue to figure out ways to make meetings more accessible, whether it's hybrid meetings, um, I think that'll go a long way. Um, I did have a question. I was wondering, do we have any sense of what the representation is like on our um, different commissions, um, because I think that as we're thinking about how can we increase representation, it's really helpful for us to know well, what's the current demographics of the various commissions, because in the absence of that, it's hard for us to be able to think about, well, where are the opportunities for improving diversity? Um, and so I think that would be helpful for us. I still have some commi commission um, vacancies that I'm trying to fill in. And I'll just say for members of the public, it is not easy trying to find people who want to serve on these commissions. So um, so that means that increasing diversity is also uh, challenging as well. And so I think it will be really helpful for us to have that information. Um, and um, and I, those, those will, that concludes my comments. I just want to um, yeah, be really thankful for all the work that's gone into this and look forward to seeing how it rolls out over time. First. Thank, thanks, Chair Fred. First of all, I want to uh, thank all the uh, commissioners and committee members and the staff members who have uh, been part of our commission process, committee process here, uh, more than four, the, I think it's 40 that we have here in the county. Um, and I, uh, I think this is a, a great effort. It's our latest effort in the county to see how we can be more inclusive and re realize uh, greater participation and access by others. Um, and I, I really appreciate the uh, the idea of offering a standard onboarding process for the commissioners because uh, they really need to, the participants need to understand what they're getting into uh, more clearly. And I think to have that an identifiable need that uh, is really important. Um, and I, I look forward to also the, the possibility, uh, the recommendations are coming back of the possibility of uh, consolidating some of these. I'm not sure that we need all 40. I think that they can, can be combined and save a lot of people time and effort uh, at the same time. Um, I have received some concerns about uh, the, the participation and I want the youth to be involved, uh, but the, the 14 age uh, factor was, somebody questioned that, is that who we really wanna have making recommendations to us? Maybe we had a youth commission before, maybe that's the answer. Um, there might be other options. I don't know if uh, we should have, uh, and some some of this commissions, I'm not sure that would have people that are 14 uh, or so. And it, everybody said, you know, you should be a voting age. Not everybody. Some folks uh, mentioned that to me. So that that was a concern expressed by some people that uh, contacted my office. Uh, but I just want to thank you for the what you've done uh, for uh, the staff and everybody who has been involved in this. Uh, it's another step forward in this county uh, for us getting more people involved uh, of, of different uh, ethnicities and races and so forth. And I think it's a great idea that we we uh, have a review of this at this time. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I also want to thank everyone who has put so much time and effort into this uh, Santa Cruz Like Me report and these recommendations. That's really an exciting step forward for our commissions. I can't stress enough how much as supervisors we uh, rely on our commissions as a source of good ideas and also as de facto focus groups uh, for some of the suggestions that come out of the board itself or come up from the community that we just want a, a closer look at. And obviously the county is making a big investment in our commissions already today. I mean, 40 commissions, 240 people 
uh, and nearly two hundred thousand dollars a year. It's, it's it's clearly a very important part of our government infrastructure, and we need it to be a vital source of new ideas and suggestions. I'm very encouraged by the comments of Ms. Vidiera Flores that the ideas are out there. Uh, and we just need to make sure that our commissions are representative and vibrant to ensure uh, that they're coming to this board uh, and getting implemented in our community uh, in a way that, that serves uh, everyone's needs in the community. I think these stipends are really a relatively small cost to pay to ensure that vitality uh, and that, you know, you know, I agree with the uh, Changed uh, the proposed changes from super, uh, Chair Friend uh, because you know after all um, you know, even one hundred fifteen thousand dollars household income um, can be a hard budget to live on in this community. Um, it's been, maybe you need the child care, maybe you need it for gas money, uh, maybe you just need it to order a pizza while you're away from uh, your family for dinner. Who knows? It can be helpful in all kinds of ways. Uh, it's also really exciting to see the um, creation of the Youth Advisory Task Force. Uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm around the Young Supervisors Academy. Um, the potential for uh, continuing and expanding that is great. Um, and also getting uh, youth of all ages involved. I mean, it was, it's a little troubling that right now we don't have any youth 18 to 24 involved in any of our commissions. Um, I, you know, I, I hear that the the 14 uh, ages sounds a little bit young, but you know, I don't want to exclude any uh, wunderkinds out there um, that, that might be really eager to make a difference. And I, I don't think that we're going to go from no 18 to 24 year olds to all 14 year olds uh, overnight either. So uh, I think there's definitely room for um, the young and the enthusiastic on our commissions. Um, I also appreciate the inclusion of uh, suggestion to rotate leadership. I know that has been an issue uh, that can lead to just um, things feeling a little restricted on some of our commissions. And so encouraging more people to become a chair or co-chair or vice chair uh, and um, help to set the agenda for those commissions is really great. Uh, and finally, I'll just say, yeah, I think this is a fantastic demonstration of equity in action and our commitment to transforming our community. You know, it's, we've, we're realizing that it's not enough to just say, well, anyone can apply for these commissions. I mean, after all, it's, it's equal. Uh, and we're saying, no, we need to take a step further to make sure people are supported in being a part of these commissions, that they are encouraged, that, they're, uh, that we actively inform people, uh, and that, that we're going to compensate people for their time to be a part of this. So I uh, applaud the effort. Thanks again to everyone who has brought us to this phase and look forward to more ideas uh, and suggestions from our commissions to come. Really brief. Uh, I also too just wanted to thank uh, Nicole Colburn and Rita Sanchez and all the commissioners that worked on this, uh, Karina Moreno and Antonio Rivas and everyone here and online for all your work and on the uh, Santa Cruz Like Me project. So thank you. We have a motion and a second. If we get a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Yes. McPherson and Friend. All right, that passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on to item nine. Item nine is to conduct a study session on the 2023 update to the County of Santa Cruz Operational Area Emergency Operations Plan and direct staff to return after the California Office of Emergency Services Review to provide improvement actions identified by the state review as outlined in the memo of the Director of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience. We have the agenda item board memo. The operation, the emergency operational uh, operations plan cover sheet and public comment version. We have Mr. Reed. Welcome. Thank you, board, um, for the opportunity to give you an update on our emergency operations plan revision. Um, to start, I just want to do um, a quick round of introductions um, for, for folks that aren't aware and just tracking. There's four amazing humans behind me um, that are part of the OR3 team. And I just want to recognize them as part of this process, part of implementing this process, and part of keeping our community safe and resilient. So behind me, we have Tatiana Brennan, who many of you have met. She's been leading our Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. We've got um, two new members to the OR3 team that I'm really excited to introduce to you today. Claire Peabody um, will be working on kind of all hazard mitigation and resilience efforts. Um, we've got Annie Puckett. Uh, she's been working on our recovery effort from our latest disasters and supporting community and the county. 
And we've got Amanda Gullings, who's just joined us as well from the University of California, Santa Cruz, um, and will be supporting our emergency services functions. In addition, um, we have uh, Chief Jim Frawley, one of our consultants here in Chambers. Um, if there are questions, um, he'll be available as well as online. Um, the principal and CEO of Mosaic Solutions, our consultant, Kim Guevara, is here as well. So I just want to walk through our agenda. I want to talk a little bit about our planned history today. Um, and state law that's driving some of this update, um, some of the plan development process, and then some key plan elements. It's a big plan, um, nearly 200 pages. Um, and so I just want to highlight a couple elements for all of you and, and the community at large um, as we review this and have an opportunity to provide comment. So in context, um, our last emergency operations plan was developed in 2015 with minor updates in 2020, but was not brought to the board for adoption. Um, since that time, we've had, as all of you know, three federally declared disasters, um, actually four if you count 2017. Um, and we've learned a lot internal to the community, to the county, um, but there's been also a lot of state laws that have changed and been amended to ensure that counties and the operational area that we oversee um, addresses the vulnerable populations that we represent, those with access functional needs, um, that's a, a nomenclature in the emergency management space that basically refers to all vulnerable populations, whether it be a language barrier, whether it be a physical barrier, um, or other um, access issues. Um, the other piece that's of note uh, is that the state is reviewing all county operational plan, um, emergency operations plans as part of state law. We were notified, I was called while at the EOC in January, that we were selected for review of our emergency operations plan. It was definitely on or three's mind um, collectively to update our plan. Um, and we were expedited in that process. We asked for as much grace from Cal OES given what we were going through in the first part of the year um, and have tried to work quickly with our consultant team to meet our, our deadline in, um, in presenting to them our plan for review. So as I said, Mosaic Solutions um, has been a key partner as our consultant team. We started with them in June. This is a very, very fast timeline. It does not mean that the time and process is done, um, but it's been basically a wholesale rewrite of our plan um, and really appreciate and have a lot of gratitude for our consultant team um, and our community for deeply engaging in the process. So through this plan development process, We've really taken a whole community approach and looked at best practices to ensure we're hearing from all voices as we develop and update this plan. So Mosaic and, and, our, and our OR3 team um, have, have had over 50 plus meetings, both with stakeholders, um, with partners, with community-based organizations to hear from them about what works well in our emergency management and response and recovery efforts, what doesn't work well, trying to integrate that voice, that information into all that we do. Um, but one of the things that came out that's, that's important to recognize is that we have a very close-knit community um, of hardworking county staff and community-based organizations that have stood up and supported community in disaster. But we have lacked the structures and systems in place to make that um, sustaining. And that the lack of systems and structures in place also makes um, the risk for the most vulnerable in our community to be disproportionately impacted by disaster higher. So, so while we have done fairly well um, in response to CZU and these two disasters, there's always room for improvement. And what we know to be true in the recovery space and in the conversations we have with folks in recovery is that those... Um, most impacted are those oftentimes in the rental community, um, those with the least amount of resources to start. So they have the least amount of resilience to be able to bounce back from those disasters. Um, so it's really important for us to think about building these systems through this plan and actualizing them and implementing them and have it be a living document. So I'm not gonna walk you through the whole plan. Um, that, would, that would bore us to tears probably. Um, but I do want to highlight four sections in particular, um, and I just want to outline the, the, the scope of the plan and just highlight a couple things for all of you. Um, this represents the base plan, the base emergency man operations plan for the county and the operational area. 
it helps inform a continuum of resilience. So that it diagram in the upper corner is really is really all of the things that OR three stands for, all of the things that the board created this office to do, um, and that the team um, is is dedicated to doing. And this plan and all of the sections help build that resilience for the community in different ways. Um, and so I want to highlight that. Um, the other thing I want to just walk through for you quickly is four of the sections that highlight some of the structural changes and relationship changes that we're working on currently and that we need to implement more, fulfill it, more fully um, to make sure that we are prepared for, for all um, that Mother Nature and the environment and climate has for us. Um, so the first section I just want to highlight uh, is the organization and assignment of responsibility section. And there's three key elements here that um, I wanted to bring your attention to. Um, the county leadership policy group. So that is a functional element um, that is activated during an emergency, an emergency. When the EOC is activated, we want to make the most informed decisions based on the circumstances of the event but also with the subject matter expertise of our key departments that are being impacted or, or needing to serve community in response and recovery. And formalizing that leadership group, formalizing that expectation of our, of our county departments and leadership um, to support EOC operations and policies and decision-making during an activation is a critical element um, that we want to more, more fully uh, form. The other piece is really building our emergency management skills and tools and training through the county emergency management team. Um, and that is a collection of, of departments. It may not be department directors. It may be um, line staff or others that are deeply engaged and regularly engaged in emergency management preparedness. So training and exercise, um, as well as policies and procedures that we build into things like our continuity of operations, so that when we're in a disaster, we're still providing the critical services that we need to where, where possible but also supporting in response. So by having a more formalized structure for the participation of key departments um, through this CMET or the County Emergency Management Team, we're gonna hopefully strive to being better prepared and respond more effectively, especially with, um, with the concept, you know, the issues that we face with staff turnover. So we have a lot of institutional knowledge as an example that has left us from CDI and we still have a lot of institutional knowledge there but we want to build the systems and, and structures to, to stand the test of, of staff turnover. The other piece is the introduction of emergency support functions. That's a way of granularizing all of the things that we need to do in preparedness and response so that it's a little bit clear in terms of lane development and who, who owns and who is responsible for different aspects of emergency response. The second section I wanted to just highlight is really um, the section five direction control coordination section and really about the readiness working group, which is uh, is a whole community approach um, engaging stakeholders. And really the, the out, outgrowth of that is is the VOAD development. So volunteer organizations assisting in development. And that's not necessarily that they are volunteering their time. It's more that they're at, they as an organization are willing to step forward and lean into supporting community during a disaster or in the context of recovery. So a key piece of that is really establishing standby contracts with key service providers so that if we need that help at a shelter, translation services, transportation support, or other avenues, we have a means of, of documenting that, that relationship um, so that we can be reimbursed by FEMA um, if they're providing services at a at a compensated rate, the other piece that's key is that we have so many nonprofits that are that are passionate about supporting community, and we want to make sure that they're in the right lane um, in support of response and recovery. Section seven, um, there's been a lot of of movement here um, at the direction of the chair and the board in terms of our um, communications and public information. There's a lot more work to do. Um, we have new PIO members that have come on board since the January and March storms. Um, we've implemented the Cruise Aware system, but there's a lot of development and improvement that can continue in using that tool. Um, and what we recognize is that no one tool is going to reach everybody. Um, not only from a from a geographic standpoint, 
where we have power issues or communication issues um, due to lost cell coverage during an uh, during an incident, but also members of the community that are um, not connected through a smart device or through community. So um, through our community alerting system. So we need to make sure that we work in close partnership with um, the informal networks, the community partner networks to push out messages as well. So that, that's a, there's a relationship there in addition to the hard technology elements to it. Um, so I wanted to say that we, we are making progress there, but there's work to be done as well. Um, the last section, just to highlight briefly, is you know re restating that we have these new this new system, these emergency support functions, and the purpose of this is to be begin to align with our FEMA and state um, systems and frameworks for emergency management, so that um, as the state, we expect the state to start to adopt the emergency support function nomenclature more fully um, as currently adopted by FEMA but so that we start to speak the same language so that we understand that when the state is communicating to us in the context of emergency support functions, we're speaking the same language as well as, as I said, for those key department leads in each of these areas to understand how they play a role in supporting community in those areas. Um, so in terms of next steps, uh, we have the, the plan, draft plan, um, as created by Mosaic in collaboration with OR3 and community is available on our county OR3 website. Um, there's a survey associated with it at community members yourselves. Anyone can take a look at the plan, offer some feedback. One of the things that we heard during our community process was even just the definition of resilience um, and what that means to different people. And especially in the context of Spanish language speakers, the word resilience in Spanish does not have the same meaning um, as it may for um, English speaking residents. So finding a common definition for resilience is one of the elements of that survey question, but also it's important to get that feedback from community on the, on the plan um, and we'll be integrating that information. Um, I know our prior, our prior agenda item talked about councils. We'll be presenting this to the, the council um, that we manage or our three manages, the emergency management council in the beginning of November. And then we'll be submitting it to Cal OES for feedback in November, middle of November. Um, this is going to be a living document. Um, it will be updated regularly. We will integrate the feedback that the state gives us. Um, we know that it's, it's not a pass fail evaluation in terms of the state's review. It's more, these are the things that you need to do to continue moving in the right direction and we'll continue and we're committed to moving and continuing to move in the right direction. Um, and so just in close, um, I know this has actually been brought up and, and I'm heartened by how often it's been brought up just today by the actions you took um, a couple weeks ago. But I want to just highlight that the emergency operations plan, the mission and directive and the effort of all of us at OR3 is really the, is an equity in action movement. And we are one piece of the puzzle, um, an important one in disaster. Um, but the work that we do to prepare community, to build resilience to community, to address climate change, is really um, embedded uh, and we are deeply committed to the county equity statement that you guys um, all passed a couple weeks ago. So uh, we're excited by the work that we need to do. It's important work um, and it addresses everybody in the community and the county, but especially those most vulnerable. And with that, I'll stop and answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Reed, and congratulations on getting selected for the update. Um, are there questions from board members before we open it up to the community? Supervisor McPherson? Yeah, it's, you've, this is a complex problem and a tight timeline, and I understand that. But I'd like to propose an additional direction that uh, yeah, this is a 200-page document, uh, and considering the importance of it uh, in a, the relatively short time frame of three weeks now, um, that um, that you reach out to each board office and just discuss it in further detail. Um, I, I think I got you've you've made a great presentation, but I'd like to just get more depth. It's not uh, critical, but I think I'd like to get more more uh, communication with the absolutely. And in regards to that as well, um, we had only had a brief opportunity to communicate yesterday, but um, it does seem that the role of the board of supervisors is a little bit still undefined and it's still growing. I, I think that 
as we saw in both CZU and then again in the floods, uh, there needs to be a two way road with the elected officials where we're information providing, we're also information receiving because sometimes people come to us, oftentimes they come to us first actually. And the liaison roles have been eliminated and now it sort of puts it all in the CAO and the PIO and I don't know that that's actually the right structure. So I just wanna flag that I can see this operationalizing in an unfortunate way come winter and I don't wanna go back through that, uh, that same struggle. So maybe as part of this discussion with each board office, we can have a discussion again about uh, ways to ensure maybe the plan isn't necessarily the best place for this because these are sort of higher level documents. But I do think that um, the guide that's referenced needs to make something pretty clear that that can survive beyond staff changes and board changes and, and, and really operationalize expectations of what the role of the board is in the communication. Supervisor comments. I was just going to say that I share those same comments that were brought up. I was actually going to um, kind of ask about around the county leadership policy group and the county emergency management team what role board members could play in that. Just because to supervisor friends comment and based on experience, having dealt with a number of disasters, I mean, people are really looking to the electeds and what their role is within these conversations. And um, and so I think it really is important that the board has some role in these different, um, whether it's a policy group or the emergency management team, or there's some other role that the board can play. I think it's really critical that there's a space for board members as well. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted to elevate one comment that I think I've heard over and over again at every meeting we have about disaster preparedness. Um, and it's related to evacuation routes. Um, people always ask, can't you just give me an evacuation route so that I know when I get that cruise aware alert or my neighbors tell me there's something I need to do, I, I, can, I just, it's hardwired, I can get out. And the answer, of course, we always give people is, well, we can't get, do that because you don't know if the there's a fire coming from the east or from the west, and um, you know it might have, it might change. I, but I think there is an alternative, and it's kind of highlighted here um, in terms of the community resilience centers, um, right? And in some cases, we might want people to you know, shelter in place, for lack of a better word, or shelter nearby, or just just get to the closest community resilience center. Um, I mean, I've had conversations with folks up around the summit, um, Stetson Roads, and it's like, you know, they're older, they can't really get enough defensible space around their own homes in a reasonable way. But there is a church nearby that has a pretty good amount of defensible space that they could reasonably get to in a short amount of time. Um, so I, we've, there's some mention of the community resilience centers in here. I would love to see that explored a little bit more as an option um, that we can explore uh, in, in you know, making sure people know their closest community resilience center, when it's appropriate to go there and what kinds of disasters, what kind of services are available there. Um, and then maybe even some practice of, um, you know, people, how, how fast can you get there? Ideal in, in, in one car and uh, with the, the needed belongings. Okay. All right, we'll open it up to the community. Any member of the community would like to provide us feedback or have any questions or comments on this item? This is a study session on the operational area emergency operations plan. Yeah, hello, my name is James Hewan Whitman. So we talked about four emergency examples, one in 2017, I'm not even sure what that is. I'm glad that we can review that 200 pages of uh, information. I tried to review what I could. So, you know, I don't know, it'd be great to have public comments and stuff about, you know, some things that I'm probably gonna remarks that are kind of critical. Uh, where am I going with this? So peace officer's job became much more difficult about 45 years ago. I mean, the problem in our society is not civil disobedience, it's civil obedience. You know, people just go along with authority and not question authority and not actually help each other. You know, the scamdemic, this is something I wrote over two years ago about Gail Newell and Mimi Hall. It's really not very polite at all. It's direct. I should read it if I have time. Uh, but actually, what's going on with you guys? What are you guys actually looking into? 
you know, I gave you guys a memo, gave it to the Santa Cruz Police Department, gave it to the Sheriff's Department and the City Council. You know, remedies or is this to do normal? Fortunately, this is a terrible example of um, peace officers. It happened on uh, June 28th, 2021. You know, it's terrible. By nine Santa Cruz police officers. When we talk about the CZU fires. Those are directed energy weapons fires. There's so much evidence about that. So I'll repeat again. I have compassion for you men because you are being controlled by international corporations. And the guy controlling this county is uh, Mr. Carlos Palacios. Anybody can look on top of sheriff's headquarters and see that frequency weapon on there. You know, his answer was, it's bigger than I thought it was. But there's a lot of information about what's going on and what's going to happen when there's really an issue, folks. Thank you. Are there any comments related to the item? Please feel free to step forward. Yes, thank you so much. Um, my name is Tim Delaney, again, speaking on, on uh, emergency stuff here. This is really in interesting. I liked your comics, comments, Manny. Um, in the Tahoe Basin, you know, we have Jeffrey and, and Ponderosa Forests, okay? And it, they behave a little more like the CZU complex forests, okay? Uh, you get a little bit of fire in there, bam, it goes off like a hydrogen bomb. You don't have minutes or hours to to get out of there. You have seconds. You have to run. So it's harsh. And you've seen it go. You'll have a huge, gigantic cloud and, and lightning bolts and even tornadoes dropping out of that thing. Okay. So when I mention these things about, you know, affordable housing and workforce housing and all that sort of stuff, from an engineering standpoint, my main fears are, are logistics and moving of people. OK, it doesn't matter who these people are, if they're black or white or whatever it is. Disaster doesn't discriminate. It's just like Lahaina, rich or poor. It's going to come in and clean everybody out. So when you're dealing with uh, these activists, whether they're on the right or left and they're pressuring you, you need to look at it from an engineering and science sort of aspect. How is this going to impact my water table? How is this going to impact my environment? How are people going to be able to move? and get out of a disaster sort of scenario. You know, you don't want to build a whole bunch of affordable housing and then all these black and brown people that you're trying to like, you know, lift them up in life. When a disaster comes, you kill them all. That doesn't make any sense, you see? So that, that's kind of the perspective that I'm trying to bring to you today when I'm comparing things to the Tahoe Basin and what they're up against and what Santa Cruz County is going to be up against in the future. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Are there any other comments from members of the community within chambers? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Call in user two. Your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, the previous speaker just said to look at an engineering and scientific aspect with these desires. I recommend a source of science is geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington, who talks about and cites the patents of weather intervention, weather warfare, patents held by Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, and the role in these fires. In terms of, and these are emergencies, if geoengineering weather intervention were halted, maybe we'd have fewer emergencies. I don't think these are natural. Also, we need landlines, a reliable, well-kept up copper landlines. The cell phones do not work when there's a power outage. And to uh, falsely pretend that wireless microwave toxic technology is going to save us only benefits the telecom interests and those that have conflict of interest. We have been, or we're still in so-called emergencies like COVID, uh, but what, what really is going on? I want to refer people to WestonAprice.org, 
myths and truths about COVID-19, contagious virus, or 5G microwave technology making people sick. And um, anyway, with emergency declaration, people get away with dictatorial policy. Thank you, Ms. Kara. Are there any other speakers online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion? Move the recommended actions with the additional direction from Supervisor McPherson, just that um, the Office of Response to Government Resilience reach out to the different board offices for um, the opportunity to discuss the plan in greater detail. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. So we could have a roll call, please. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? And friend. All right, and appreciate everybody being here. Appreciate your work on this, Chief Holloway, as well. we'll. Move on to item 10, a presentation on the 2023 Flood Preparedness Week as outlined in the memo of the County Administrative Officer and Deputy CAO slash Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. We have the board memo. Uh, the winter prep storm presentation. And with us today, we have the uh, Mr. Wiesner is the Assistant Director of CDI and Dr. Mark Shredley, Executive Director of the Papua Regional Flood Management Agency. Mr. Wiesner, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Friend, board members, and CAO Palacios, and members of the public. Uh, my name is Steve Wiesner, Assistant Director of the Community Development Infrastructure Department. And I'm pleased to be here to give you a presentation on flood preparation in our county um, as we enter the rainy season. You can go to the next slide. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so we're all aware of the atmospheric river event, uh, river weather events that we experienced uh, both this past winter and in 2017. We're also aware of the El Nino phenomenon that currently is out in the Pacific Ocean, which could bring higher than average rainfall this winter. Um, so I'm here with Dr. Mark Stradley, director of the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency, and he'll be presenting as well. And in this presentation, I'll cover some of the preparation efforts that uh, the Community uh, and Development and Infrastructure Department has been engaged in with a focus on South County work around the Pajaro River and Coralitos and Salsapuedes Creeks. Dr. Stradley will cover some of the work that the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency is involved in as well. Um, I will mention before we get going um, that this presentation does come just in advance of the state's Flood Preparedness Week, which is October 21st through the 28th. And as such, we'd like to remind our residents to, to be aware be prepared and take action if needed. Um, know your risks and, and know if you live in a flood prone area and please pay attention to the weather, weather forecasts. Um, always have a to-go kit and be prepared to evacuate early and have a plan for where you'll go and what you'll do with your pets. Um, and please take action if, if you hear any warnings or evacuation orders, if and when they come. There's a lot of great information both on the county's website and also the State Department of Water Resources website about flood preparedness. Okay, um, so some of the work that our county has been involved with, um, October 15th, it's got kind of a magical date for us as, as we turn from fall into winter um, and we expect to start seeing storms. We've already seen a couple actually come just north of us. So as such, our crews are out there busy getting ready um, and preparing uh, both our county roadways and our flood control channels, um, creeks and so forth um, for conveyance of all of these storm waters. So we've been pre-positioning pre equipment all over the county, and in particular down in the South County area at our Roy Wilson yard, um, where we store much of our flood fighting equipment that's stored in containers that are provided by um, the State Department of Water Resources. Um, there's all kinds of stuff in there, uh, lots of extra sandbags, um, all kinds of plastic and visqueen, just the types of items we use for flood fighting. Um, and we're storing about 230 feet of muscle wall that actually was used last year. Um, but it's been cleaned up and it's back in the yard and it's ready for deployment for this winter. Um, and in addition, uh, the, our department, the Department of Public Works, um, distributes sand to regionally uh, to many of the fire agencies around our county. Um, you can, and we've done that already. We've done our regular both sand and sandbag delivery to the agencies that will take them. There's a comprehensive list of where you can find those on the Department of Public Works' website. 
Okay, just and also just to remind you that the road crews are out there. They're very busy as well, all over the county, 600 mile road network. Um, they're focusing on cleaning ditches. They've been doing this all summer, um, inspecting all our culverts and making sure all of our drains are working uh, in preparation for the winter. It's a little bit of a timeline of events. You can see here, um, you know, post winter, the beginning of the summer, our crews go out and they inspect all the channels um, and they'll start looking to see where um, log jams uh, might be obstructing flow. And so they'll start working with property owners to clear those log jams. Um, we also were engaged in a um, fairly robust flood fighting training course alongside the city of Watsonville staff on the lower Pajaro River. We did that in September. Um, we have crews and contractors that are actively repairing uh, some of the erosion sites uh, on the Pajaro Le River levee system. These are sites that were um, damaged as a result of the last winter's um, flood. Um, and like I mentioned, the county delivers sand and sandbags to various local fire departments. We've already done all that, and then we, we will replenish them as needed. Um, and we're scheduled for further training, um, both the roads and drainage crews, uh, for fall protection, confined space entry, and then we're doing also swift water rescue training this year with the drainage crews. Okay, um, and just, we are out there working on all the roads throughout the entire county. Uh, there has been uh, quite a focus though, down in the College Road area of the county. Uh, there that parallels the Salsipuedes Creek. Um, you know, this area got overwhelmed during last winter's floods. Uh, and so we saw uh, large sediment buildups in all the pipes that convey convey storm waters to, to the system. Uh, so the crews are out there actively this year, uh, flushing every single culvert we have that goes underneath College Road and in and around 152 and all land. Um, also the uh, county road crew is involved in doing some flood control work. Um, this is off San Andreas, a Spring Valley Road. It's a, it's a road that's had uh, increased amount of flooding over the last 10 years. And um, so the road crews out there actually raising the road up a little bit to try to alleviate some of the, the annual flooding that we've seen. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about stream bed maintenance that the crews have been involved with. Um, like I said, they do a lot and do visual inspections. We work with property owners on identifying where some of the um, debris buildups are, and we'll work to remove those blockages. Um, and this involves oftentimes just very large log, dram, log jams and down trees, uh, removing excessive vegetation and so forth. Um, there has been also the similar type of work, not just down in the South County, but up in the San Lorenzo Valley, um, Bonnie Dune, Soquel, Aptos um, areas of the county as well. So specifically, Corlitos Creek, actually, we saw a lot of debris come down from the upper watersheds and a lot of tree falls. And we had some very significant log jams on Corlitos Creek that were removed this summer. Um, in particular, between Green Valley and East Lake Boulevard, um, large log jams there, and then at Scourge Lane. Um, and then we discovered another really large one there near Story Road and Varney on um, the crossing there. And we removed that too as well. This oftentimes again involves working with private property owners. On Green Valley Creek, we cleared multiple log jams on Green Valley Creek. Um, and so we're hoping that that's nice and open for this winter as well. And then on Coward Creek, um, that section between 129 and the Barrow River, um, you know, when we get big waters in the Barrow, the flap gates close um, for Coward Creek. And so we see, it's very typical that we'll see this type of sediment buildup, um, but the crews were able to get out there this summer and remove all of that as well. Okay, I'm just gonna touch a little bit on zone seven system, which is really purely the Barrow River levee system. Um, the crews were very active this summer in their regular maintenance program. And, um, so all their pre-winter maintenance has been completed. And, and this involves, um, you know, compacting levee, levees, both on the inside and the outside, doing vegetation control. We're working on several culverts that both need improvements and replacing out there. Um, I'd, uh, I'd, we did do a small um, sediment removal project right at the end of uh, spring um, at Salsa Puedes, at the confluence of Salsa Puedes and Coralitos Creek. Um, so we're able to get at that. And that's nice. I kind of opened that other area up a little bit as well. Um, and then I mentioned that we're in construction. We're going to be in construction on a couple significant erosion sites on the Pajaro River, River levee as well. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark, Dr. Mark Strudley for his presentation.
All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, the Power Regional Flood Management Agency is in the transition point right now and assuming uh, operations and maintenance responsibilities. A lot of things that Steve just described to you will transition over to PERFMA responsibility in the coming years. But at this point, we've been focusing a lot of our e efforts on coordination with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Monterey County Water Resource Agency to repair the catastrophic levee breaks on the Paha River. So the first one is uh, site one, which is upstream of the town of Paha. This is where all the flooding, flooding originated. Um, this one is actually completed now. So this slide is, is a little bit uh, out of date, but it has actually been completed. It is all buttoned up um, and there's some little bit of cleanup uh, with the Army Corps contractor, but this site is um, completely repaired at this point. Uh, site number two is the second erosion spot that nearly chewed through the levee beneath Highway 1. The Army Corps and their contractors are working on this site as we speak, um, and the hope is that this site is going to be completed uh, sometime before the end of November. And then site number three is where the floodwaters that move their way down through the floodplain on the Monterey County side ate through the levee at the downstream end, trying to make its way to the ocean. That repair site is um, in construction right now as well by the Army Corps contractor. And again, that's expected to be completed by the end of November. Um, PERFMA has also developed a flood action strategy or action plan that is um, going to leverage the Governor Newsom's executive order N-10-23, which uh, alleviates some of the state permitting and regulatory requirements for these types of repair and remediation actions. So some of that work has actually started now. We're conducting some vegetation maintenance uh, within the channel system as well as replacing a culvert and also uh, purchasing a new pump station generator for the power village pump station um, adjacent to the city of watsonville um, this comprehensive emergency action plan effort uh, is also underway that is going to uh, amplify the flood action strategy and going to articulate how PERFMA is going to interact through the emergency operations setting with its various member agencies moving forward. That's going to be something that's going to take a lot of conversation um, and thought to how that's going to work because we are a new agency. And obviously, my staff and I can't be in three places at once. So we're going to have to figure out a new strategy. Um, and last year was a very good test case to understand how it might work in the future. Um, we have lots of other ongoing efforts right now. Um, we have a uh, grant application in with the Federal Highways Administration, uh, which we're calling the Pajaro Birds Project, which is a bridge infrastructure resiliency design study that's looking at improving the Highway 1 overcrossing over the Pajaro River. Uh, we also have the Pajaro Bridge to Bay Project that is seeking some feasibility funding right now um, and likely to get some from FEMA. That is uh, Reach 1, the section of levee system between Highway 1 Bridge and the ocean. We've also just received word with um, our uh, partners that we're moving forward in our application process for the NOAA Climate Resilience Regional Challenge, which is to offer some potential funding for other regionally significant flood control efforts on the Pajaro River. We're also engaged with the Army Corps and a number of other projects through their Engineering with Nature and Silver Jackets programs. And we're also pursuing a community-based flood insurance program that will investigate uh, the feasibility of developing a program that will provide immediate relief to victims of flooding based on uh, certain criteria being met. Um, at this point, uh, we have also completed our negotiation with Zone 7A um, and have a cooperative agreement in, in place that will fund uh, the pursuits of both Zone 7A and some of the capital reserve needs of PERFMA. Um, and uh, most significantly at this point, the long-awaited levee reconstruction project on the Paha River is now going to be underway. Uh, we will be signing a construction contract with the Army Corps later this month or at the very latest November 6th. So this is a huge, huge milestone. We're actually going to construction. It's a very exciting time. And many of you have also seen uh, the governor's signature on AB 876, which just occurred uh, late last Friday. Um, that is something that will smooth the way for this uh, levy reconstruction project to go to construction next year. Um, with that, uh, Steve, did you have anything you wanted to add about the flood fighting last year? Uh, no, just to, just to, uh, just to say that, um, 
you know, the county's prepared, you know, to have a lot of uh, rain this, this winter. Um, we know how bad things can get. Um, we know, we know where to watch. We, we, uh, we've got a very robust uh, monitoring system and that if we experience something similar that we saw in 23 or 2017, we're fully aware that we'll be in another flood fight um, and we're up to the task. That's all we have. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation. Uh, questions from board members, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Thanks uh, to both of you and to the entire um, flood control district and, and public works divisions for all the work uh, in the various creeks and uh, riverbeds. Um, my question is about Soquel Creek, of course, uh, one of the, the, the area that flooded the worst in, in my own district. Um, and I know there was a lot of excitement from residents in Soquel Village to see that um, there was some um, vegetation management happening noticed in the creek and then uh, feeling a little bit un underwhelmed that not all that much vegetation was actually removed. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, sort of the process and evaluation that goes into seeing what should be removed from these stream channels um, and uh, just in particular, any work um, done along Soquel Creek. I had heard uh, that there was some larger log jams upstream more from the village. I don't know if those have been addressed um, to prevent the you know, possibility of those would break and create a surge of water or anything like that. Um, yeah, so on SoCal Creek in particular, we do have an annual vegetation uh, maintenance program um, after the Bar Bargetto Bridge got built uh, some 20 plus years ago. Uh, we've we've undertaken a regular vegetation management program in and around the bridge itself. And it really is associated with the bridge. And we have to work with all the different environmental agencies out there that have purview. Um, so this would be like the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and so forth. And so we're very careful and select and, and surgical about uh, about what type of vegetation um, and debris that we do remove. Uh, we do do it regularly and we try to get as much as, as we can out. Um, it wasn't identified that that was the source last year of, of the flooding that occurred on Soquel Creek. Um, but I will remind folks that Soquel Creek is not uh, one of the flood control channels that the county has purview over. There's a lot of private property issues above that bridge uh, that folks need to be paying attention to. Certainly if things come down to the bridge or they look like they're going to impact public infrastructure, our crews will be out there plucking that stuff out. Um, the extent of our work is really in and around the Bargetto Bridge itself. Yeah, thank you. Questions from Supervisor, Supervisor Hernandez. Yes, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the report and for CDI improvements preparations for this upcoming winter. Um, you know, I got the opportunity to see uh, our chair, Zach Friend on KSBW last night, reminding us of the uh, the uh, governor's order. And uh, it, it brought a little, you know, concern to me about the uh, some of the risks flooding in the interlaken area of Santa Cruz County. And, you know, it did experience multiple floodings in January and March. Um, and it was in the Lake and Orchard Park neighborhood areas in particular. But it did also, you know, the overcresting there in that part of Corlitos Creek also caused some uh, flooding um, out in the East Lake College and Senior Village area. Uh, so given the governor's uh, executive order, uh, I wanted to see if it, it makes it easier to remove sediment and debris from the creeks um is there anything that we can do to remove or has there been any cleanup of that area or is there anything that we can do to clean that area of uh Coralitos creek uh that where they uh converge with Celsi Puedes and sort of about 200 and 200 yards back i think it's adjacent to the the creek adjacent to the uh, lakeside organics property uh sort of behind that Orchard Park market where, where it converges. Um, I do have a map showing where the area is at if you know anyone wants to see, but I wanted to see if there's anything we can do there to remove the additional sediment in this area um, to reduce the risk of flooding. You know the area so, I'm talking about? Yeah, or, yeah. Oh. so I think we can both address this question. So some of the images that Steve showed of um, the log jams being removed are in that area or just upstream of it. Um, so that was, as my understanding, I was done this past summer. A lot of the trees that people see, uh, especially if they're looking at them from the, the Orchard Park Market or from Houlihan Road, a lot of those trees are actually 
up kind of on the cusp of the floodplain. So they don't interact with the water surface until the water starts spilling out of the channel. If there are additional tree blockages that we're unaware of, we can probably collectively address them. But my understanding at this point is that the clearing has been relatively comprehensive through there. The problem with removing sediment is locally is that you just end up creating a divot in the channel that ends up filling back up. It's really a regional issue. And my understanding is that most of those sections are, with the exception of where Corlitos Creek joins Salsipuitis Creek, most of those areas are scouring naturally. And so the material is being removed by nature. And then I also am aware that the Zone 7 drainage crews did clear a bunch of sediment out of that confluence area with Salsipuitis Creek. Uh, last last summer, right? Yeah, because recently we're still getting a lot of uh, concern from the, those neighborhoods, the uh, Lake Inn, uh, Orchard Park area, from neighborhood that neighborhood, and also the owners of the uh, Orchard Park uh, Center, I guess. Uh, concerns about sediment as well that has been accumulated back through there, basically where that not breach but overflow overcrest or whatever it's called uh in that area so that was one of the areas of concern that if we can look into you know further look into because we've got these winter storms coming and the neighbors there that were flooded you know twice in, the, in that area are concerned and rightfully so yeah i mean we can certainly take a, a second look uh at some of these spots but i will point out that part of the reason the levee reconstruction project is prioritizing construction in this reach is because of these acute sensitivities and because it is an unlevied portion of the system. So there are no Army Corps levees between Green Valley Road and East Lake Avenue. That's part of the reason why the creek jumped its banks there is because there is no protect protection there. Um, also, it's important to realize that the New Year's storm that we got last year was four and a half feet uh, water surface elevation four and a half feet above what the channel could contain itself. And there was a, a creek clearing and walkthrough that was done last December immediately before that storm system came through. So that came through on a relatively clear and free creek. And there's just no way a storm of that magnitude can be contained within that natural channel. And that's why we're prioritizing the project to start there. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, just I think it's a reminder. Just want to thank um, Supervisor Friend and Dr. Spreadley for going back to DC month in, month out to get 2024 Pajo River uh, really levy improvements are not going to come fast enough. But uh, thank you again for that effort. I mean, it it was 60 years and coming or something like that. And uh, thank heavens if we have it coming now. Thank you. Um, you know, there's been a significant amount, a significant amount of work, in particular on the Santa Cruz County side, from a maintenance perspective, a funding perspective, uh, a repair and a rebuild perspective associated with this. It's a 75. At the end of the day, it's a 75 year old levee that was built to standards that were inadequate in the late 40s and are clearly inadequate to protect the lives and property of the communities today. And it took a significant amount of legislative work to get to a process by which we could make this prioritized at the state and federal level. We've accomplished that. Um, basically a $500 million project, it's a half a billion dollar project. And we're having this project covered by the state and federal government. Um, with the first segment, because of regulatory relief from uh, Speaker Rivas's bill beginning, you know, and within, the next year, which is a pretty remarkable thing. Um, it didn't, it, uh, to Supervisor McPherson's point, it can't come fast enough. The, the conditions by which the communities have been living under the flood threat are actually not substantively changed over the last 75 years. The communities, don't, because the levee is the same levee. Um, what's changed, and there's been floods as, you know, in 55 and the late, mid to late 90s and 17, it barely held and then it broke again. So the underlying elements of it aren't fundamentally different. And there has been significant and continued advocacy to receive this funding. And we finally were able to secure that. It's still going to be a few years until this is fully completed. And 
So I have a couple of questions just in regards to that, maybe for Dr. Stradley. Well, first question actually for, for Mr. Wiesner, you had mentioned that uh, you'd mentioned the culvert clearing and um, uh, some of the tree removal in that area as well. If the community, maybe a little bit to Supervisor Hernandez's point, if the community sees an area or has a concern of an area in advance, they want your crew to check out, what would be the best way that they could they could submit a request for your, your team to go look at something? Uh, yeah, there's several different ways to reach us. Um, I, I'll mention my Santa Cruz app. Um, that's a great way to reach us. It has very specific information about there, about tree down trees and so forth. Um, but if you're not technology oriented and you want to just make a phone call, you can certainly just call the Department of Public Works at 831-454-2160. That's our main line during normal business hours. And then we have a dispatch number, um, which operates 24 hours a day. That's 831 831- Four seven seven three nine nine nine. Um, there's also ways to email us too, and our website has all of these very well articulated. If you go to the county uh, Department of Public Works's website, thank you uh, for Dr. Strudley. The repairs that the Army Corps are completing will make those segments, the those vulnerable segments, significantly stronger than they were in the previous storm. I mean, really building it to a modern standard, kind of giving you a preview of what the the future levy will look like. What is the 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 top line message you would provide to residents in both Watsonville or Pajaro or in the South County region on both sides for as we're working through what could be a potentially challenging winter and before we're able to complete the rebuild of the levy, what's the message for the community from a preparedness standpoint or an information standpoint? What would you like them to know? So I tell this to everyone in response to the questions, for example, to, you know, what kind of storm scenes are we, are we going to have like El Nino? And I, I say the same thing in response to this question, which is people need to be prepared to react and respond to messaging that comes out from our emergency management partners. If there are evacuation warnings or orders that come out, they need to heed those. Cause as you said, the parts that are being reconstructed right now by the Army Corps and their contractors for these repairs, they are, in fact, excuse me, stronger than what was built in the 1940s. But they're just small parts of this levee system. The rest of the levee system is the same old levee system we've had since the 40s, which is undersized and structurally weak until we can build a new levee system. So people in general terms can hope for the best and prepare for the worst but in specifics as steve alluded to in the beginning of his talk people need to have their go bags ready they need to have their arrangements made and their own self-responsibility aspect of preparedness until we have a new levy system built and they can rest easier until that time we're going to be taking every effort we can to bolster the system um, to provide some extra level of effort to try to keep this system uh, contained and, and structurally sound until we get these new levies. But we are still living um, with a heightened level of risk until those new levies are built. Thank you. Please, Supervisor. Thank you. Just one additional question uh, to the point of being prepared. Um, you mentioned that there would be uh, sandbags distributed in October. Is that Coming next week to celebrate Flood Preparedness Week, or uh, what? When? How, oh, so what we do this do every year. Sandbags every year, and they're, they're, we have a regular um, group of fire stations that we distribute to. Um, we'll pretty much take them to any fire station that will that will take the sand and the sandbags. It's a bit a bit of a lift for them because they have to monitor it and then let us know when they need to be replenished. But we've made those deliveries, and you can find a list on our website as to where those are. All right. Thanks. We would open up for the community. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us specifically on this item? The free step forward. Thank you so much. I'm glad I showed up today just to, to tell you a few things about what's happening with my community on the top of Summit there. Um, I don't fully know, but the last time I was out there driving around, maybe like a month ago, I think the road by the church there, Skyland Church, going over to the, towards the fire station, I think that still looked like horror. So there's that road. And then there's also uh, the road um, that's old Santa Cruz. It's in Santa Cruz County. It's in Santa Clara County. I like Santa Cruz County to, to communicate a little bit with Santa Clara County because I'm looking at these roads, whether it's flood or fire, these are escape routes for my community. And uh, we feel kind of trapped at the top of the mountain here if something's going down, okay? And uh, 
Also, there's a, a pole that's in front of my home. I think it's on Miller Hill there. PG&E needs to come in and, and replace that pole. Because again, you know, in event of disaster, flood, or like the winter storm that we had last year, or a high wind event, that pole can go down. It's a fire threat to my community and a communication threat to my community. Okay. Now the Soquel Creek, my apologies, the water from the rainstorms comes from probably from my house, right? And uh, you might want to do some investigative work up around my house, around the Silver Mountain Winery and in the canyons in there. It's horrifying. There's radical stuff that's pointed down towards Capitola and, and Santa Cruz County. Just so you know, I don't know if it's all private land, but and how to deal with it. It's like a sand pile with huge, massive trees all pointed downhill. And uh, so it's hard to say whether or not you want to disturb it or not, or um, you know whether you want to try to get in there and mitigate the flow of water so it doesn't bring something catastrophic down onto Capitola. Okay. Thank Anyways, uh, thank you so much. You thank folks you. have a fine day. Is there anybody else in chambers? I'll see none. Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. I'm sorry, sir. Would you you had wanted to speak to as well? All right, please feel free to step forward. I'm sorry, Madam Clerk. We'll bring it forward. And yes. I was wondering if the soil or the drinking water was affected by the flood in Pajaro. It was tested. All right, thank you. We'll take that under advisement. Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Um, I don't question the intent and sincerity and work that people are doing on this. However, so many trees have been cut down everywhere. And trees and vegetation help hold the soil in place. So I question the wisdom of, uh, like, clear-cutting along the freeway over the years, um, along the rail trail everywhere. Um, also, refer people again to geoengineeringwatch.org, Dane Wigington and to view the film, The Dimming. He states that drought and deluge scenario is a hallmark of geoengineering. Here's just a few notes here. The nanoparticles that are released and 60,000 nanoparticles are the width of a human hair, are covering the planet like a layer of glass. And this results in climate, ecological collapse. It's this huge destruction. 60, 40 to 60 million tons annually of climate engineering particles are distributed and, the, distributed and the planet is ubiquitously contaminated. So what we're talking about here today is in huge part caused by geoengineering and that should be uh, halted. He states there is no natural weather at this point. None. Thank you, Ms. Kara. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. I think we'll bring it back to the board. Let's see if it's an acceptance file. I'm sorry. The action is. It's just a receive, so there's no specific board action. We appreciate uh, both of you providing the presentation. Oh, just one quick, the, the question was the drinking water impacted through the sediment at all, Dr. Shredley? So I, I, I can't say for certain. We, we are aware that generically when there are floods, there are water quality concerns that play into agricultural viability, in particular organic farming because of potential contaminants that can come from floodwaters. But I don't actually, I'm, I'm not aware of to what extent the water supply has been affected by any contaminants in the floodwater. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the team for that presentation.
Uh, the final item before closed session is item 11, which is to consider a report on recycling and solid waste long-term planning progress to direct community development infrastructure to turn on a report November 19th, 2024, with a recycling and solid waste long-term planning report and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO. We have the agenda board memo. And here today we have uh, Casey Kloss, our recycling and solid waste services manager, and Bill Hoxford, our department administrative analyst. And who's beginning, who's kicking it off? No? All right, please. Thank you. I'm going to confirm the microphone's on, Bo. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Friend and board members for the opportunity to share some highlights of the county's recycling and solid waste services. Cycling and solid waste services are responsible for all aspects of waste management, which includes preparing for the closure of Buena Vista landfill and designing a transfer facility to replace it before it closes. We are regulated by state environmental laws, including the most recent Climate Action Bill, SB 1383. This slide and the next were completed during a study session with our consultants, HFNH, where we mapped out how we are going to accomplish our goals of waste diversion and given the legal trends and changing economic climate. This was conducted pre-COVID or as we have it listed on the slide, the uncertainties. Our vision for the future of solid waste and diversion in Santa Cruz County takes into consideration the values and aspirations of the community. We all want to live in a community that we can be proud of, a community that is innovative and a leader in promoting a sustainable environment. While we've been planning for a transfer station to be co-located with organics processing at the Buena Vista landfill, we have been looking at the potential for alternatives to composting, such as waste to energy technologies like gasification or even the potential for an anaerobic digester. Both of those types of technologies would help with items that aren't truly compostable, such as uh, compostable foodware, cups, and bags. In fact, we may want to look at revisiting our biodegradable packaging ordinance to exclude these items as they will not compost in the time frame that most commercial composting uh, operations uh, take place in. The most recent aerial survey of the Buena Vista landfill took place last fall in 2022 and revealed that at the current rate of space, util space utilization, uh, there's approximately five to seven years of remaining capacity at the landfill. It's vital that the county have a transfer station up and running before this time period lapses so that unincorporated county residents continue to have continued access in the South County for their waste disposal needs. In 2022, the county held a protest vote to establish a new recycling and solid waste infrastructure and closure charge that first appeared on the unincorporated parcel tax last year in 2022-23. This charge was approved for five years and we will have to return to the board every five years with the new engineer's report and protest vote with adjustments as necessary. The allowable use of these funds is limited to the Buena Vista transfer station project design, construction, and eventually the bond payments. We're also allowed to use these funds for any current transfer operations from the Buena Vista landfill, as well as contributing to the landfill closure costs, which are current, currently are estimated to be uh, between 15 and $16 million. And we currently have in the closure fund approximately 12 to 13, uh, 12 million dollars. Beginning to assess the charge now, we are able to pay for design and permit stages, as well as to lower the overall amount that we will have to borrow by placing money in a reserve account. This is an informational flyer from our website that we have devoted to the Buena Vista Landfill project. As you can see, it's a little bit out of date as our EIR uh, is not yet completed. Uh, as of today, a project description is being developed along with the EIR, and once ready, we will update the information on, on this website and this board. 
The Ben Lomond Transfer Station has been in operation for over 30 years, and it's in need of maintenance and upgrades. What began as a project to address some stormwater runoff issues, as well as some electrical upgrades, quickly es escalated into the realization that the scale house needed upgrades and the scales themselves were approaching the end of their useful life. It was decided to add these improvements to the scope of the project rather than to perform each project over a span of time. Illegal dumping continues to be an issue through the, throughout the state and Santa Cruz County is no different. One of the best tools that we have in the county to combat illegal dumping is our bulky item collection program that was written into the franchise agreement that's available to all residential green waste customers. Customers receive three bulky item collections per calendar year by appointment. We also have outreach and education staff that do targeted outreach to businesses and residents to help business owners and residents collect correctly sort their waste. Green Waste also has outreach and education staff that our staff uh, works with uh, to better serve the county residents. In addition to our county roads crews and parks departments, we also partner with other area nonprofits to conduct litter uh, cleanups and illegal dumping abatement. And with the help of the general services department, uh, we recently were able to obtain a surplus vehicle, surplus van actually, that is being donated to the downtown streets team. And CDI is working with the downtown streets team to add a new crew that'll be in addition to the North Coast and Felton uh, projects. One of our partners, the Trash Talkers, um, which we brought to this board last year, uh, has been helpful in bringing many of the jurisdictions and county partners that work on issues of illegal dumping and the same to the same table to discuss and coordinate our collective efforts through their Pitch In Santa Cruz campaign. Park staff have been placing Pitch In signs throughout the county, unincorporated areas of the county, at parks, beach access points, and as well at trailheads. The signs have a QR code uh, on them that can be scanned and will take uh, people who scan it to a website with uh, all the local jurisdictions information, Santa Cruz City, Capitola, uh, RTA, RTC. The county has also recently procured two high-powered cameras, along with two decoy cameras that we will be deploying in the coming months after we receive some training from the manufacturer. These cameras are solar powered. They have a five second delay, which means that they won't take a picture and, unless something's been sitting there for five seconds. And um, the, we'll only actually be checking these cameras if we find an illegal dump, dump at that location. During the most recent storms at the beginning of 2023, the county dispatched disaster debris boxes to the hardest, loca hardest hit locations throughout the county. One of the lessons that we learned from the January storms was that need to monitor these boxes and remove them at the end of each day. Unmonitored boxes became overfilled and created a cleanup issue uh, for, uh, for CDI staff as well as residents in those communities. During the March storms, we did use this knowledge and we did not have any boxes that became overfilled as the boxes were emptied more frequently and were monitored at all times. They're also taken away at the end of each day. Santa Cruz County debris management efforts will require improved waste management tracking from the time waste is collected through the time that waste is disposed. This cradle to grave waste management system is necessary to achieve reimbursement of, under both state and federal programs. Waste management and diversion really begins with education. With our green business program, we are able to work with businesses in not only reducing their waste, but also how to properly manage their waste, reduce energy consumption, and to be role models in the business community. Our partners, Environmental Innovations, are excellent at helping businesses achieve their goals of becoming a green business, and they promote the companies that become certified on their, green, on their media pages through the California Green Business Network. Similar to the Green Business Program, the Green Schools Program aims to educate young people to be good stewards of the environment. The lessons that 
are taught meet science, state science requirements, standards, and are grade level appropriate. Uh, lesson, lessons focus generally on stormwater runoff and waste reduction. SB 1383 implementation began January of 2022. Its primary goal is to reduce methane from the atmosphere. The number one contributor of methane gas to our atmosphere is open landfills that leak methane from rotting organics. And another important aspect of SB 1383 is to collect food, edible food before it becomes food waste. The amount of insecure, food insecurity in California is staggering. We're lucky in Santa Cruz County that we have the nation's second ever food bank and the first in California in the second harvest food bank. They are a great partner and are helping the county as well as the four other jurisdictions to fulfill this requirement. Food waste is now being diverted from landfills in every jurisdiction within the state of California. Our programs allow customers to use their existing green organics cart to dispose of food waste. All food items are currently accepted except for raw meat, compostable foodware, and bags. Outreach and education continues to be conducted by both county and Greenway staff to educate the public. SB 1383 also requires a group effort by many government agencies to meet the goals that the legislation envisioned. CDI has been engaging with other county departments uh, to meet the procurement policies and com compliance enforcement and mandated by SP 1383. CDI continues to promote reusable products over single use products and advocate for extended producer responsibility or EPR legislation. We recently concluded a campaign that we partnered with the California Product Stewardship Council to get people to switch from one pound single use propane canisters to refillable reusable ones. And also to petition the store owners to uh, become either refill stations or uh, exchange programs. Progr the campaign was successful in that we were able to uh, obtain uh, nine locations throughout the county uh, that became exchange locations. For the past several years, Gray Bears has been accepting polystyrene at their Chanticleer location for recycling from the public. Due to spatial constraints, staff safety concerns, as well as cost, they stopped accepting the material for recycling. While CDI was researching the potential places that could continue to recycle the material, uh, we, we found that all of the options were actually cost prohibitive. and. Um, Quite, quite so. Uh, at the same time, though, CDI has learned of new legislation, SB 54, which could solve the pol problem of polystyrene for us. SB 54 was recently signed by Governor Newsom and will require all packaging in California to be recyclable or compostable by 2032. It also requires there to be 25% plastics source reduction by weight and unit by 2032. Sorry, by 2025. SB 54 creates a de facto ban on polystyrene. The material currently only has a single digit recycling rate and will need to meet 25% meet a 25% recycling rate by 2025. Uh, by January 2025 and a 65% rate by January 23rd, 2032. Um, as you can see by this quote from uh, the Nature Conservancy that's on the slide, the, the, the fact is, is that with such a low rate of current recycling, um, the chances of them actually being able to continue using, utilizing the product within California is highly improbable. We all ask that the board uh, take the recommended action and one, accept and file the Recycling and Solid Waste Long-Term Planning Progress Report and recommendations on zero waste planning. And two, direct the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure to return on or before October 29th, 2024 with the Recycling and Solid Waste Long-Term Planning Progress Report. Thank you. Are there are questions from board members. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. 
Thank you, Chair. I just want to make sure I understand that last point you made about styrofoam, which is you're saying that um, it'll, thanks to SB 54, effectively be outlawed as soon as 2025, because that's when that first 25 percent. Yes. Okay. Well, that's encouraging. Um, obviously, it's uh, it's too bad we won't have anything to do with the styrofoam between now and then. But um, I understand that. Uh, unfortunately, Gray Bears doesn't want to take on the program anymore, and um, it sounds like the other nearby options are, as you said, cost prohibitive. Um, I was curious. I mean, that the SB fifty four bill also points out that you know it talks about monitoring levels of of you know, I guess recycled content or like how much each one of those materials are actually recycled. Do we have any kind of monitoring of um, green waste and their recycling rates? I mean, you know, they we say they're recycling, but I'm aware that, you know, a lot of stuff will just end up, um, even recyclable goods could end up in the, uh, you know, whatever, last go, goes through the last call line uh, and ends up in the trash anyway. Um, I mean, inevitably that will happen with some amount of the recyclable materials. Do we have any data back from green waste as far as, you know, what percentage of, different recyclable material types are actually being recycled? Um, Casey Colossa, Recycling Solid Waste Services Manager. Um, Green Waste does give us uh, quarterly reports and annual reports. They lump all the recycling together as one you know, data quantity, but we can get breakdowns. What happens is our, our county's recyclables get mixed with their other jurisdictions and at their sorting facilities. So I think they could portion it out we could get numbers by you know how much is plastic and paper and cardboard and so forth yeah i'd be very curious to see that um i think that it's you know we should demand some accountability uh for the people who say they're doing the recycling on our behalf to know that that's actually happening and i think that uh with some of the modern tools uh image recognition and cameras etc that it is definitely possible to get that level of reporting at this point thank you yeah, uh, Mr. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I want to thank you for the staff for this uh, report and um, to see that we're making progress on all fronts, really. And um, several months ago, I toured the uh, Regen Marina Landfill Waste Diversion Facility with the CDI team and learned about uh, their its capacity to take the county's organic waste. And we learned that, in fact, it can uh, take all of our organics. And Regen uh, did a agree to include all of our county's uh, organic waste stream in their fe feasibility study. So that I think that's terrific, terrific news. And I hope that's moving along uh, as you anticipated. Um, I also appreciate the progress that we, you've made uh, in partnering with downtown streets team, particularly in Felton and the North Coast. Very much appreciated in that organization to be commended uh, heartily. And I appreciate um, you working with human services and uh, uh, health services as well, and your collaboration with Trash Talkers, a, a relatively new agency or new uh, group that wants to make Cal uh, Santa Cruz County the cleanest uh, county in uh, California. Uh, the uh, what's the anticipated time frame uh, for uh, CDI to finish its uh, analysis of building um, a co composting facility in Buena Vista versus uh, sending our organics to the marina facility? Do you have a timeline on that? We're we're close. To, we're we're about that thirty percent. We keep we've been we have alternatives for the compost facility. Um, currently, we're studying the idea, uh, like you said, of taking all of our organics. Continue basically continue at status quo with with processing the material, um, cleaning up the part of part of the landfill to pave it, so we can deal with our uh, water quality issues up there. Um, it's still an option for the compost facility, but it's looking more and more that because it is expensive and we do have this local um, area to to take the material that that will continue. Um, as far as a timeline, um, I know we're we were hoping to have that EIR, as I mentioned, already completed by this this summer. Um, we had a recent meeting with our uh, contract, our construction management, project management team for that. And it's looking probably, I think she said, uh, sometime we should be able to see a full project description go through sometime this, this year or this fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
on start by thanking you for the presentation on this. Um, I know you brought up uh, the potential need to look at the biodegradable packaging ordinance, and I'm just wondering if you could speak a little more about that and how we could be helpful with that, and or if that's something maybe that could go to the integrated waste management task force for some input prior to it coming to the board. It, it could definitely go to the waste task force. That's always a good start. It's I mentioned that just in the sense that to, we can we can use that that ordinance and amend it to ban certain materials complete outright. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, polystyrene. I don't want to get in trouble. Polystyrene is uh, is is on that list. We can, you know, but we we really should look. What I really want to look at is the the compostable foodware cups and those bags because we've heard from our uh, processor. Uh, that you know they have a 90 day throughput and it, it those those materials can take up to six months um and it's kind of telling because i so i do the annual report for to cal recycle every year um and they're for the last couple of years they've had a question on there of what where if we found any uh MRFs or any any facilities that will accept that material for composting and i don't think there's any jurisdictions in the entire state that have I know anywhere around this region, nobody's taking it, not with our um, throughput rates. So that's 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 what I was kind of getting at at that that we could uh, take those those materials off of that off of that ordinance and just have to be recyclable. Period. Yeah, I think that's probably something worth exploring. Um, so if there's an opportunity for us to have that come back, I think it would be good. Okay. Um, and then if there's, you know, also if there's an opportunity for the integrated waste management task force to weigh in on that as well, I think. I think it'd probably best to go to the task force first and do like a study session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, and then you mentioned the camera placement and I was just curious if that, if those cameras are going to be placed at just sites where there's frequent, um, dumping. And so just to get some. Yeah. Um, so my bandwidth's been a little bit uh, stretch lately, but I, I've had conversations with our road superintendent, Alex, and we, I'm just working with him to get, you know, the top six hotspots located. Cause we actually, I have to bring it to the board. We were gifted some, um, cameras as well. So we'll have four total once the board accepts, allows us to get the gift and we have two decoys. And so I want to put cameras at the top four hotspots and then the decoys at the top, top two, and then, you know, we can move them around. They're not, you know, it just takes a, a cherry picker to be able to move around. Great. Well, that concludes all my questions. So just want to thank you all for your work on this. Thank you. Open it up for the community. Is there a member of the community that would like to address us on this item? It is an action item. I see none in chambers. Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Call in user two. Your microphone is now available. Our I think of Judy Berry, who worked with Earth First, trying to save the forest, and she stated, capitalism cannot exist without destroying the Earth. The corporations are the instruments of capitalism. It's corporations producing all these plastics and other contaminants. And what they do is they privatize the profits and they socialize the costs. So here we in the county with county funds are supposed to try to take care of basically a problem that really can't be taken care of. Microcurrents are everywhere. So the cost of capitalism's corporate contamination is what we're dealing with. You spoke of the illegal dumps. Make it illegal for the corporations to dump their plastics on everyone. And they got to do it a whole lot more during the pandemic. And plastic does not decompose. So I see this as unless the production is prohibited, we're going to always run around trying to be good Samaritans to deal with ubiquitous uh, forever contamination, including cell phones 
masks. I heard you're wearing a, a mask, and uh, there are a lot of masks in this ways. It's a myth that masks pose no danger. Wearing a mask, analysis, here's a little fact for anyone wearing a mask. You'll probably cut me out. Thank analysis. You, Is there anybody else online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. I would bring back to the board that we need a motion for this item. Yeah, I'm happy to um, accept and file recycling and solid waste long-term planning progress report and recommendations on zero waste planning and direct the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure to return on or before November 19, 2024 with a recycling and solid waste long-term planning progress report. I'll second, I'll second it. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hander. Supervisor Cummings. And then just for clarification, do we need to include direction on the, um, the compostable waste ordinance and having that go back to the um, integrated waste management task force? For a study session? We might as well just add it on. I mean, it's an easy yeah. thing to add on. So with additional direction that, why don't you articulate the additional direction? Yeah, the additional directions to have the um, compostable waste ordinance uh, go to the Integrated Waste Management Task Force for a study session. Is that okay with the seconder? Yes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on that task force as well. And so we're directing you to do more work. Um, <laughs> I'm the chair. So enjoy. Yeah. Well, both of y'all directing each other to just have a good old time. Work. So if we could have a, a uh, roll call, please. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson and friend. All right, and that passes unanimously. Thank you both for the presentation. Thank you for your work on that team. Uh, we're going to move into closed session. Council, do you anticipate anything will be reportable at a closed session? No. All right, we'll move into closed session.